and, seems uh, like they, it seems so long ago and like yesterday at the same time, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is very true. It is very true. Uh, first, I just want to uh, congratulate again for receiving this uh, very prestigious Von Kamen Award. It's a really a distinguished award, well deserved. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, read the details of it. I don't know that before. It's like once every five years. Yeah. Right. Uh, One person every five years. It's a really a distinguished uh, award. It's yeah, and especially with... you know, uh, I've spent so much time at Caltech, right? I mean, and uh, and von yeah. Karman is such a such a huge, huge influence uh, here. So it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, no, it's great. It's great. So, uh, um, yeah. So at, at Caltech, at this period, I know Caltech is uh, much, much smaller than other uh, universities and colleges. So for this uh, very special period, the pandemic, is it a little bit easier for you guys to to keep everything like uh, to keep social distance and uh, 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 is a little bit easier for you to resume all the research activities? <laughs> In a way, I, I, I suspect that is correct. Um, you know, it's a small community. Uh, um, uh, it's also uh, generally kind of, if I look at lab densities, they tend to be low, right, uh, inherently. So I, I think that makes it easier. Uh, but that also has its own kind of challenges because very often where in larger places, some of the support services would be a whole community at Caltech, you're one person. <laughs> So okay. it's this balance, but, uh, you know, so far we've been working for about five months, four months in the labs. And uh, as far as we know, uh, there's been no transmission on campus. That's great. Um, and in fact, you know, I mean, this is something which um, I speak to my counterparts at, uh, as vice provost to my counterparts at many universities. And as far as our group can tell, there hasn't been a transmission in any university in the research setting. So hmm. it tells you we can operate if you're careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, for, for the class, for the uh, undergrad class, do you offer like in-person class or still mostly no. remote? We are remote for the winter, uh, for, oh. uh, sorry. We were remote in spring and we are remote in fall. Um, I s we haven't made a decision about winter. Yeah. Haven't? No. Yeah, I'm teaching uh, two courses. This is full quarter yeah. at home. Yes. Uh, I haven't taught like since the, the, the yeah. campus is clo was closed yeah. because uh, uh, for the uh, spring quarter, I, I was uh, free of teaching. So and then some of the summer break. So I haven't taught for like half year since the campus was closed. Now I suddenly need to teach two courses. It's a bit challenging. It it's is. Remote uh, mode. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, and if you have not taught online before or kind of these flipped classrooms before, you yeah. almost have to do twice the work. Uh, yeah, it's a completely I, I different kind of agree. style of uh, preparation. Um, yeah. So uh, try to talk to different friends and colleagues, try to get some uh, helpful hints and, and uh, uh, tips, tips from them. Yeah. Uh, but still a lot of things uh, are yeah. expected. Sure. And uh, still need to experience them and sure. <laughs> learn by yourself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what I'm, really, hmm. Go ahead. what I'm interested in is we are doing this giant forced experiment, right, on pedagogy. And uh, yeah, what I'm really interested in is how we will change our teaching style three years from now. Uh, right, right. You know, I mean, we will change. 
because sure. this experiment will teach us things which we can do differently. And, uh, and I, I, I'm really curious about that, how pedagogy will change uh, mm -hmm. three years from now. Yeah, well, actually, we are forced that for many years, um, people are promoting the idea of flip the classrooms. Now, yeah. for many of us, you have to flip the classroom. There's no other choices, right? So you record yeah. the lectures and then let the student come to the class to discuss and ask questions. So that is yeah. essentially is the flip the classroom. Yeah, and you know, in a way, what we are realizing is that universities value arises as a community and not because of particular classes we're taking. The fact that you have a community and you learn together, you act together, you know, that a university is a lot more than just classes, a collection of classes. And I think that's really what we are learning in many ways, right? I mean, we can continue to do our classes, but uh, I wanted to quickly say hello to John, who I haven't seen in a long time. Hi, John. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Sorry. Su Ling is uh, here. Su Ling is uh, a ad an editor of uh, EML. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So Hi, Kashuk. Yeah. Thank you for doing oh. this for us. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's a great pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's a privilege. I was reading your uh, uh, mini book, Theory of a Martin Static Microstructure and the Shape Memory Effect. Yes. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it, I enjoy reading it. It's so clear. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it was so lecture weird, notes yeah. I made a long time ago when I first taught because I had to. <laughs> <laughs> It's very good. It's a, it's a, I think it's a co, uh, strong work with the advisor, James, right? In, uh... Yeah, it's been, you know, I mean, it was basically trying to, uh, it's parts which I learned from my thesis, part during my thesis and parts during my postdoc and really taking five years after that, reflecting on it. So it's kind of basically drawn from there. And uh... it's great work. Yeah, thank it's you. Great work. Very nice. Yeah. Mm. Hi, hey, Jimmy. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah. Good to Good see to you. See you again. Yeah. Thank you very much for doing this. This is Oh, wonderful. it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, okay, so we can uh, ask another question. Uh, so, Koshi, I know you're going to talk about a liquid crystal elastomer, and I also know your work on uh, shape memory alloys. Since I was a student, uh, yeah. I did a little work where I joined Harvard with Gio and uh, yeah. have interest in shape memory alloys. So certainly I know your work and uh, the book uh, Sulin just mentioned. But besides these two, I know you have been working on many, many different topics. Some uh, relatively briefly, some like liquid crystal last summer, you have been continuing working on it for uh, a few years. So it's probably a good idea to uh, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, other projects uh, beside liquid crystal elastomer. Sure. Um, I don't know if it's a, uh, already also challenging for you because you have been working on so many topics. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, uh, so many topics. Uh, being at a great place like Caltech has this wonderful advantage that we have this great supply of enthusiastic young minds, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, and the different students come with different ideas and different things. And, and so you, what they don't know is they think you are their teacher, but what they really don't know is they are my teacher. Yeah. And, uh, so you kind of try to inspire them to do something and some of them go and run with it and you end up learning so many new things. So, okay, uh, let, me, let me say a couple of things that I really am spending quite a bit of time now. Um, and, and you'll see that 
uh, part of what I do is develop methods and part of what I do is try to look at new physical problems. Uh, and because new problems inspire new methods and new methods inspire progress. So on the method development side, um, for a long time, we've been talking about multi-scale modeling of materials, right? Mm -hmm. We look at different scales. And what, in a way, what we have really achieved is not multi-scale modeling, but modeling at different scales. And we haven't figured, right? I mean, even you think of going from density functional theory to molecular dynamics or molecular statics, atomistic forces. It's basically been very much kind of disparate rather than trying to do this all in some ways. And the reason for it has really been the computational challenges. Uh, you can say that I'm going to do things at multiple scale, uh, but basically underlying that, we make some assumption about separation of scales. We do some theory here, then we kind of fit some parameters. And um, So two things really, two things really, I, I think that there's a new opportunity in trying to do this because of two reasons. One is there's a very big, uh, change in computational platforms that's going on now, right? Uh, for about 20 years now, we said, okay, we are going to put CPUs and each CPU, we're going to put lots of processors, 20, 30. And then we are going to have these processors communicate by using some kind of fast interconnect. Um, but each of these processes is extremely uh, versatile, right? I mean, so that's kind of the typical high performance computing cluster. But really what changed is the emergence of GPUs or other accelerators where you can pack a few thousand processors on a chip. But the computational platform is very limited. It can, it is, it can only do things which are essentially single instruction, multiple data. So every processor has to be doing the same thing. Uh, but it allows you to have incredible amounts of computing power in, in very small clusters, right? And uh, so there's kind of a few orders of magnitude jump in the amount of computational power that you have available to you. So that's one. And the second, and I think um, it's very fashionable, but in a way, uh, what you could call machine learning or um, is, is a new tool. Um, you know, uh, I like to joke that mechanical engine, um, people in mechanics always did machine learning because you can think of a typical rheological model. And you, <laughs> you know, we always knew the great advantage of piecewise linear continuous functions, right? <laughs> Uh, which is what a neural net essentially is. Uh, but joking aside, it is a way of doing regression at a scale that we did not know how to do before. Right? Mm. And it, I think, will enable us, where I think the opportunity for us is really enabling us to reimagine how we do our experiments. We were always taught that to an, do an experiment, you have to get a uniform strain state because you have to do the data inversion problem and we didn't know how to do it. And I think this tool allows us to do, will allow us to really reimagine how we do experiments and how we learn about phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, and so coming back to where I started, I think how we apply these tools to kind of hierarchical structure of materials, these two tools, this enormous computational power, this enormous uh, ability to do regression, I think is quite exciting. So that's one thing that I think a lot about, um, 
how do we, you know, finite elements requires a lot of communication to assemble. So can I exploit, but if you think about all continuum models, it's universal balance laws, which are linear, right? I mean, they're all Helmholtz projections. Divergence of stress equals zero, curl of strain equals zero, right? I mean, they're, uh, and, and local constitutive relations. They're nonlinear, but local. So these are perfectly suited for doing these kind of parallel, embarrassingly parallel computations. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. So that's part of what I think about. The other part which I spent quite some time thinking about is failure of heterogeneous materials. Mm. If you think about a metamaterial or heterogeneous material, we know how to calculate effective moduli, effective behavior, when you have a nice variational principle. But when you have an evolutionary process like in fracture or retention or phase boundary propagation, it's extreme statistics which really guide it, right? Because it's a pinning and things like that. And we don't have good tools to study them. And uh, you can think of that as a problem or you can think of that as an opportunity because you can make small changes and get very large changes in effective behavior because it's extremes that really describe the behavior. So that's another kind of interesting area that I've been kind of thinking about. So at least those are two. So Kaushik, can I uh, ask a question follow up to your first part? Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, significant increase of the computing power uh, in recent years. And yeah. you probably noticed that this uh, the, the NVIDIA uh, released this uh, two new card today. And yeah. not today, this year, recently, right? A few weeks ago. Yeah. So, Several minutes, is, uh, the pre-ordering is out of stock, and uh, a lot of demand over there. And uh, yeah. as many people probably need to wait until next year to receive yeah. them. So um, the impact or the influence of these uh, uh, development and advances in hardware um, definitely will impact the, for example, the computational mechanics in multiple fronts. Uh, sure. What do you think the you 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 talked about a, a multi scale uh, uh, modeling for example? Yeah. Um, at which scale? Uh, I know we are so far we are still uh, doing modeling at different scales instead of really going multi scale, right? So the lower scale uh, modeling like. Uh, molecular dynamic stimulations and also first principle DFT calculation are still very much computing uh, resource demanding, right? Sure. So sure. do you think these uh, current uh, advances in hardware like the GPU, are they game changing or they are changing our thinking accelerating the uh, modeling or are they really in the near future uh, uh, paradigm shifting to some new thinking of our uh, computing method? Is that really the case? Just like uh, several decades ago when uh, finite element is really can you can do a lot of things and it really sure, change sure. the way we design sure. and understand mechanics. You know, okay. Uh, I, game changing, paradigm shifting, or I don't know, but uh, you know, I'm in a hard things to say, but if I think back, you know, even 20 years ago, using a parallel machine, right, was a high art. Very few people did it, right? Com computation in many ways, or doing a large finite element calculation, let alone you know it, it, within solid mechanics, doing a large finite, it was a specialized activity, right? Today it's not specialized activity; it's something which everyone does, right? I mean, this is not. Uh, so, did it change the game? I mean, 
So what it's basically creating a completely new tool in our toolkit, right? And did it change the game? In many ways, yes, because what was what we used to do by approximate stress analysis and try to figure out, you just run something, visualize it, uh, and you gain insight. So did it inherently create new knowledge? I don't know, but it allowed you to explore things which you were not able to explore before. And therefore it allowed you to make progress in other fields. So now if I think that on a single node, I have of the order of, you don't even have to go to the new NVIDIA chips. I mean, these kind of uh, 16 GPUs with very fast communication from GPU to GPU, each GPU with about 2000 uh, processors. So you're talking on your desktop, what was a, High performance com uh, computing cluster from a uh, Bayou cluster from five years ago, right? And that has to have a huge effect, right? Uh, and with, and I think the effect would really be where, at least this, is that it enables you to do things which you couldn't do before, which essentially means that you'll. It's, it's hard to directly trace any particular idea back to it, but it would contribute in so many different ways. Right. All right, Kaushik, can we ask you to uh, share your slides? It's at 10 o'clock. Wow. And then, um, Shen Chang, you take it away and um, introduce sure, yeah. the speaker. Should I do it right now or after oh, question? No, no, no. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, you can okay. do it now. <clears throat> cool. So yeah, uh, hello everyone. So uh, today it's a great pleasure for us to have uh, Professor Kaushik Bachachuya from uh, Caltech to give our uh, EML webinar here. And uh, uh, Professor Kaushik is currently a uh, Howell and Tyson Senior Professor of Mechanics and a Professor of Material Science from Caltech. And he's also currently a Vice uh, Provost of Caltech. Uh, yeah, apparently, um, he has uh, received numerous awards from a different society uh, uh, for uh, recognizing his uh, uh, high influential work. Uh, most recently, he received the uh, Von Kamen uh, Award from SIAM, which uh, I also uh, learned to know it's uh, one person every five years. So uh, without further delay, I probably uh, will ask uh, Akash if you want to uh, take from here. Thank you, Sheng Cheng. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here this morning, this evening. <laughs> Um, so, um, Jigang asked me to talk about liquid crystal elastomers, and I'm really pleased to do that. This is a subject which I learned from Mark Warner and John Biggins and others. Uh, and it's amused me for the last few years, so happy to share that. But before I go into liquid crystal elastomers, I wanted to kind of talk about this in a slightly broader context. And part of why I think of, why I think of materials like liquid crystal elastomers. So now I'll do this by invoking, thinking about robotics in many ways. Um, or if you want, you can think about robotics, or if you want, you can think about really devices in many, many and complex devices. So here's not the, 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 here's a fairly recent Boston Dynamics robot. And it's really impressive, right? I mean, it's on the human scale. It's got, it's about 1.5 meters tall. It's about 75 kilograms. Um, but then, it becomes less impressive. Its payload is only 11 kilograms. That's what it can carry. And it has 
it's considered complex, but it only has about, uh, how many, uh, 28 degrees of freedom, right? So it's impressive, but still really somewhat lacking. And the way it's made is by really putting to a frame and on the frame you attach little pieces. And the way I think about it is that the analog of this is really the ENIAC, which many of you know was the computer that was built in 1946. So it had 20,000 vacuum tubes, etc. But what I love about it is 5 million hand soldered joints, right? That's it could do a gigantic 500 floating point operations per second, and it needed a small power plant to run it. And you see what has happened since then in this field. Today, we, this is about a few years ago, so this is a, a typical microprocessor today. It's got the order of 10 billion transistors. Nothing is made by hand. And what is also remarkable is the growth in the number of operations it can do, but also the power consumption, right? I mean, if you think about the power per operation, it's nothing. So what did it take to make this revolution from here to there, what we often call Moore's law? And when you think about it, there were three real major innovations. Uh, the one was, the fact that we replaced vacuum tubes with semiconductors or silicon, which allowed a process like CMOS, which it's an integrated way of uh, making things. And there was also this hu huge advance in the way you design things, which is VLSI that you allowed, which allowed you to design things with this level of incredible complexity uh, because at any point, a designer could focus on a particular scale, get the performance characteristics from a higher scale, and then a bounce from the lower scale, and then propagate the information down. So part of what I've been thinking about is what do we see here? And I call this the material as the machine. And really it is because what would have to happen is rather than making these in this way of having a frame and putting things as we did in the ENIAC, we have to find ways of doing this in an integrated fashion. So if you indulge me for one more minute on this, uh, you need something which allows us to do this hierarchical way of designing so that a designer at any level gets a specification from a higher scale and then conveys the range of things that I can do to the higher scale so that this person can then design this particular scale. And there are reasons, you know, I mean, we are nowhere close to doing this in the context of materials and, uh, but there are ideas which are coming in which allow us to do this in some kind of modular fashion. And um, so this is something which is an interesting kind of intellectual challenge that remains open. Second, you need the analog of silicon and which essentially brings me to partially towards the topic today, which is multifunctional materials and structures. And then you need a way of manufacturing and perhaps this ways of 3D printing of uh, is a way of doing it, uh, we can talk about that. I could get, talk about the right and the left topics, but today I want to focus on this. And I'll try to make the case that what is key for multifunctional materials and structures is trying to exploit phase transitions. And combining phase transitions or material instabilities with structural instabilities. That instabilities actually are a tremendous opportunity for building in function. So let me spend a minute talking about phase transitions. 
And something which I hadn't realized going through my college education is how common phase transitions are when you think about solid state. So when you think about a material and a material is a collection of 10 to the 23 atoms, which are all interacting with each other. So you can imagine the number of locally stable states is enormous. So you have a very large, you have this complex, large number of degrees of freedom, but you also have this very large number of local states. So some states will have higher symmetry and some states would have lower symmetry. And typically the low energy states tend to have low symmetry, but because their symmetry is low, they have tend to have high entropy and vice versa, the high, symmetry, uh, high, the high symmetry states tend to have higher internal energy, but lower entropy, right? I mean, here I'm showing you a picture of liquid crystal uh, phase transitions in liquid crystals, but you can think about this in any crystalline solid, in any anamorphous solid, you have a high symmetry phase, which is high energy, lower entropy, low symmetry phase, which is, so phase transitions are very common. And when you have two states, you have a low energy state with high entropy, which means that if you look at the free energy as a function of temperature, this is how it looks. Whereas the high energy state, low entropy. So this is how it looks. So you'll immediately have a phase transition. So phase transitions are common and it allows, gives you this kind of free energy behavior. But if I look at a temperature somewhere here, and I plot the energy as a function of whatever order parameter or state variable I have, I have a highly non-convex energy landscape. And when I have a non-convex energy landscape, what it means is that if I have a very small stimulus, I can change state from here to here. Why is that? Because if I have a stimulus, what I have to do is to look at the free energy state. You have to look at the analog of the Gibbs energy, if you will. It's a free energy minus whatever this. Stimulus is minus whatever the uh, times whatever the order parameter is. So you're trying to minimize this. So you can see that you're trying to minimize with the line whose slope is S. So as I change this slope a little bit, you can see I jump from one state to another. So a phase transition is a very easy way of building in very large changes. It's more than that because as I said, there is a lowering of symmetry typically in a phase transition, which means at the low energy state, at the low temperature state, you have multiple low symmetry states that there is a symmetry breaking and consequently you have multiple equivalent low energy states. So that's what I've kind of shown here in this energy landscape. This is high energy state. This is the low symmetry states. And there are multiple variable versions of this or variants of this. So what that means is that I have a very degenerate material at the low, uh, at the low temperature. So I can start making mixtures of these degenerate states. And so, the behavior I have will not be this blue line, but will be something which is given by this dashed line. Right? So you see that despite the fact that the energy landscape was nice here, hard, right? The curvature is large. Here you have a very flat energy. So you get you have a very soft material in some regions, you have a very hard material in other regions. So the symmetry breaking leads to degenerate states, which leads to microstructure, which leads to really tunable properties. So phase transitions gives you the ability to have a tunable material. Now, <clears throat> and I'll show you uh, some examples of this. This is in the material level. We also know that slender structures can undergo instabil structural instabilities, buckling, wrinkling, uh, 
And so there is huge opportunities in combining these two instabilities or using one to offset the other. So that's again, provides another tool. And the fifth, which I will not talk about, but which is actually quite important is also, if I have a first order phase transition, like I've shown in these pictures here, the change of entropy that you have at the phase transition is latent heat. So latent heat provides you with a mechanism for transferring incredible amounts of energy back and forth. So that's another real great opportunity of trying to build in functionality into materials. So for example, solid state coolers use essentially this idea, right? Uh, or in fact, even the, your air conditioner uses this idea. Uh, but you can also do it in solid state. So I want to keep at least the first, this, these three principles, the fact that non-energy landscape gives, makes it very responsive. Symmetry breaking gives rise to a tunable material and this combination of material and structural instability. I want to keep these three things in mind. Right. Um, so now let me come after that kind of long detour, let me come to what I wanted to talk about, which is liquid crystal elastomers. So let me remind you what a liquid crystal is. So liquid crystal is a liquid made of stiff rod-like molecules. And today I'm going to, going to talk about rod-like molecules. So if I'm at a high temperature, there's a lot of, and uh, so because of the high temperature, there's a lot of vibration. And so basically these are all randomly arranged, right? So you have an isotropic liquid, typically clear isotropic liquid. Now, when I cool down, the fact that these are long stiff rod-like molecules, and I want to emphasize these are molecules. These are not macro particles. These are molecules. So they're about two nanometers in length, typically. Think about of order two nanometers in length. Because you have now calmed them down, there's a steric interaction where they'd like to line up next to each other. So overall, they develop an orientation and that is called a nematic phase. So there's a phase transition from the isotropic to a nematic phase. So hold that thought, that's what a liquid crystal is. So let's think about an elastomer or a rubber. It's a polymer made of lightly cross-linked polymer chains. So I have this kind of soft, long molecule. You have lots of them, and then you lightly cross-link them. And now as you pull them, the different segments can move freely, but they're still kind of joined together. So they are a soft, soft, solid. They're solid, but barely so. And all their elasticity is essentially entropic, at least for small uh, strains. So a liquid crystal elastomer is a combination of the two. So if I take one of my polymer chains and either in the main chain or as a side chain, put in one of these nematic, um, um, nematic mesogens, I basically get what is a liquid crystal elastomer. Now, the cross-linking density is low enough that the liquid crystals still undergo this isotropic to nematic phase transition. But when they do, they take the rubber molecules with them and basically you end up with a large change in shape. So you see that here's the isotropic phase where the nematic molecule, uh, uh, the nematic messagens are all randomly aligned. And then I cool it, they, they become aligned just like here, but they take the rubber molecules along with them so that a box like this will now contract laterally, elongate in the direction. So this is what happens. So, uh, so you can see that this is a piece of this nematic elastomer. And I believe this was a video taken in Mark's office. So this I got from Mark. Um, so as I heat and cool, you can see that this is expanding and contracting. So here's the data associated with it that you have as you cool 
you see there's a very large change in length. And I want to put some numbers here. So the spontaneous deformation, which I will use a parameter called R to de describe it, is very large. So stretches are of the order of one or two, right? So it's doubling, tripling in length. The elastic modulus is of the order of a megapascal, maybe a tenth of it, maybe slightly higher, depending on how much cross-linking you have done. The blocking stress is about 10th of a megapascal. Um, uh, so when you think about a stretch of one, a blocking stress of about 100 kPa, what you find is that the energy density is very high. It's 10 to the five joules per meter cube. So what that means is that despite the fact that this is a soft material, the amount of actuation power that it can provide is extremely large. To give you an comparison, a human muscle is 10 to the two joules per meter cube. A robust, good piezo actuator is about 10 to the three. A shape memory bulky thing would be 10 to the six. So despite the fact that this is a soft material, it's an amazing, act, has an amazing ability to actuate. The second part comes from the fact that there's symmetry breaking. So if I take a piece of liquid crystal elastomer where, uh, where everything is aligned, all the pneumatic is somehow aligned in this direction. And if I pull on it, if I pull perpendicular to it, I will get this as my stress strain behavior. You see the very soft behavior. Whereas pull in this direction, I would get this kind of behavior. So you see that there is a very different kind of uh, behavior depending on the direction in which you pull. And that has to do with the fact that there are so many degenerate states and I'll spend some time talking about this. The other part about this, about these materials is that they are a great medium to couple other behavior. And so here's an old experiment by uh, Ikeda and his colleagues, <clears throat> where they took azobenzene, which is a light activated molecule, and embedded that in liquid crystal elastomers. So azobenzene is basically two benzene rings. And when you apply it with a certain light, it undergoes this trans to cis transition. So, right, so there's a shape change where the benzene rings rather than being elongated kind of fold together, right? And you can see that you take a strip like this, you hit it with light because light only penetrates a small amount, it starts folding. You hit it with a light of different frequency, it comes back. You change the polarization of the light. Now it actuates in a different way. And uh, so you can build in light activation into these materials. So let me <clears throat> give you one more piece of kind of material science before I go into kind of mechanics and of these. Now I told you this, this is a made by taking these polymer chains with the pneumatic messages and then cross-linking them. And you can cross-link, so you, you actually start with a highly non-Newtonian liquid. At high temperatures, it's isotropic and at low temperatures, it's pneumatic. So you can choose to cross-link it in the isotropic state, in which case you'll get what I call an isotropic genesis material. And in this, because the parent material was isotropic, there's really no preference in orientation, so the director can reorient. And so this is kind of material which you'll get soft shape conforming behavior. On the other hand, if I go back to the liquid, let it cool all the way so that you form these kind of pneumatic patterns or you pattern it. So this is a typical pattern and this is a pattern where you have created these disclinations, still a liquid, you cross link it. This director pattern is built into the rubber matrix. So the director is frozen. And so this turns of material is actually very useful for actuation and shape morphing. And I'll try to touch on both today. 
So let me begin with this isotropic genesis materials. And the, the warner tarentiev theory for these materials. Right? So let me go back to what you may have learned about rubber elasticity. So rubber, as I mentioned, is these lightly cross-linked polymer chains. So all of its elasticity is entropic. So if I take a very large polymer chain, the probability that the end-to-end -end distances are, if the chain is long enough and uh, can be approximated by basically this Gaussian, right? So this is of course on, um, not good if R goes to infinity, but still in the reasonable ranges, it's actually a pretty good approximation. So the entropy of a single chain is given by this. You just basically take minus kT log P. Now let's come to the cross-length solid uh, of polymer chains. And suppose I have some box and these are the cross-linking points. So there are some random distribution R. Now I stretch this and I make one assumption and that is that all the cross-linking points basically deform homogeneously. So the chain which connected this point to this will go from here to here, so on and so forth. I can calculate what is the change of entropy in this. And if I did that, I would end up with basically the, what we will mechanics would call the Neo-Hookian constitutive relation, right? So basically the Neo-Hookian constitutive relation is nothing but a description of this entropic change as you default of some kind of macroscopic entropic change. So the water trentive theory tries to do the same thing, but in the context of having a nematic director field. So the probability is no longer isotropic, but is anisotropic with respect to this anisotropy matrix or step length tensor as it's called, which tells you that there's a preferential orientation in the n direction. And then it's, uh, so it's preferential in the n direction. So if you did that, you essentially end up again with something like the Neo-Hookian, but with this step length tensor inside. So as you'll see later, the step length tensor depends on the amount of nematic order so it's a function of temperature. And basically the square root of it tells you what the spontaneous deformation is from relative to the isotropic state. So here's the theory. So this is the part that I described to you. The cross-linking density is not exactly homogeneous. So there are fluctuations. <clears throat> and you can show that because of that, in every neighborhood, there is some preferred orientation, right? I mean, if the crossing density is not uniform, if I look at any point, there's a slight preference in certain orientation. So that gives rise to what I call non-ideality. And then there is basically the liquid crystals don't like to align, uh, like to align themselves, the steric interaction, and there's some nematic elasticity, what is called nematic elasticity associated with it. And this is what is called the single constant approximation to it. So if I look at the num some numbers, the ratio between alpha and mu, at least the way I've written it, is very small. So this is a small contribution. This contribution, the ratio between kappa and mu gives a length scale, and that's of the order of 10 nanometers in these materials. So if I'm looking at specimens which are large compared to 10 nanometers, this is a very small contribution. So you can do what is called an ideal theory where you kind of ignore these terms, and that is what we'll work with for a minute. So this is the ideal theory. <clears throat> So if I look at the ideal theory where, where I only have the entropic contribution. So let's try to probe this. So I'm going to define some kind of elastic energy as a function of deformation gradient by minimizing out the director. If I did that, I'll end up 
with certain amounts. You can very quickly convince yourself that th this has many, many zero energy states when you're at a low temperature. Why is that? You can show that E of F equals zero whenever F is some rotation of this step length tensor. Actually, it should say L to the one half. Sorry, I'm missing a one half here. So, so basically, if I can, if I can stretch in any direction and rotate it, that's a low energy state. So let's try to think about it kind of physically rather than mathematically. So I had this isotropic material. I made it here. It's isotropic. I cooled it. It came to the state. But there's nothing special about the state. This was an isotropic material. So horizontal is the same as vertical. So there's symmetry breaking. So it could have gone here. So all these changes of shape are perfectly allowed. And they all have zero energy at low temperature. So this is the degeneracy that you have. So in some cartoon that I shall use over and over again, this is the isotropic state and all possible stretches in the direction N are low energy states and that I'll describe by this circle. But there is a lot more than that. Notice that if I'm at the low temperature when my energy is zero on this, all these different states, I have a material which is no longer, doesn't satisfy the usual conditions of strong ellipticity. So it doesn't satisfy the Ademard, uh, Legendre Adamard condition or the kind of rice stability condition, if you will, in mechanics, right? So it's not rank one convex. In other words, I can find two states, one shared one way, the other shared another way. So I can take a specimen, I can shear one one way, the other the other way and put an interface against it. This would be perfectly compatible. And therefore this would also be a low energy state. And if I repeat this at a fine scale, you see that I get a shape which is different from any of these individual shapes. So not only do I have all these different states, but I can create states in between this by making mixtures of multiple states. So these are called striped domains. <clears throat> and this is really what is responsible for the soft behavior that I showed you before. So again, going back, this was a specimen where all the directors were oriented this way. And you can tell that the directors are homogeneous by the fact that this is translucent. As I pull on it, the rubber chain could deform entropically or the directors could change. And then basically the directors rotating gives you a low energy behavior. And so you go from here to here using a stress strain curve, which looks like that. But what happens in the middle is interesting. As you rotate, you're actually shearing the material. The grips don't allow you to shear. So half of it shears one way, the other half of it shears the other way. You form these striped domains. And basically that's why this forms on a scale of microns, which is essentially why it scatters light. And that's why it becomes opaque. So opaque is a sign of fine scale microstructure. So you form this fine scale microstructure and that's what allows you to give this beha soft behavior. If I pull in this direction on the other hand, the directors can't rotate. So you see the usual rubber elasticity. And that's why you see this very different behavior in the different directions. So this is this kind of tunable modulus that I was talking about in my kind of conceptual slide. Coming back here, this energy is not stable. And in one of the kind of remarkable feats of mathematics, Antonio de Simone and Georg Dolzmann were able to prove, compute the exact relaxation. So they were, able to compute the effective energy after you have taken into account all possible microstructure and all possible consequences of microstructure. So basically what it tells you is that you more or less know everything you need to know about this ideal structure because of the relaxation. So let's come back to the non-ideal case. And I'll still ignore the uh, Frank elasticity. I'll just put the non-ideal term. <clears throat> what it tells you, as I said, that 
because of the inhomogeneity fluctuation and cross-linking, there is a preferred orientation at every point. So you can ask, what is the effective energy? So in other words, if I take some volume of this and I give some average deformation gradient and try to allow all possible direct orientations and all possible deformation gradient, what is the effective energy? That's a hard problem, but it turns out that you can do some bounds. This term is non-negative, so throwing away this term gives you a lower bound. You have to work a little hard to get an upper bound. And we use some ideas do, going back to Pedro Ponte Castaneda by using polyconvex functions. Uh, because it's finite elasticity, you just can't do your usual averaging. So, um, and you can compute a upper bound. And what you can show is with this energy, the energy is bounded by these two levels here. So the lower bound is the red, uh, the green dashed line. And the, this particular upper bound turns out to be this red curve here. So the behavior is bounded in some ways within a very, very light region. And by one of these, okay, so generally when you have bounds on the energy, they don't give rise to bounds on stress strain behavior, right? And that's a very important point and a very common mistake. If I approximate a function, it does not mean that I'm approximating its derivative, right? So I take a, think of the function one plus epsilon sine X over epsilon, epsilon is small, that means that one is an approximation. But if I differentiate it, it, the derivative is sine of x over epsilon, which is very, can be very large. So the derivative of one does not approximate it. So the a bound or an approximation on an energy does not give you a bound or an approximation on stress strain behavior. But in this case, in this case, because we are probing uniaxial behavior, it turned out that the bounds on the energy and the fact that the energy has to be convex in one dimension because of the baker erickson uh, inequality basically tells you that the effect uh, gives you bounds on the stress strain behavior. And that turned out to be a very good um, approximation for the actual behavior. So, uh, uh, so, what this tells you is that all this complicated behavior we learned in ideal liquid crystal elastomers is also true in non-ideal material. And that turned out to be a remarkable, remarkable uh, finding because up till that point, you tried your hardest in the lab to make an ideal material. What, this finding independently by Urayama as well by John Biggins was that you could try, you could actually create materials which are non-ideal. As long as you cross-link it in the isotropic state, you'll have soft behavior and all these wonderful behaviors. So now let's come back to try to go a little more. So I want to understand what is the effective behavior more completely. And it's an incompressible material. So basically I have to be able to do two independent stretches. And so one way of probing that is through membranes. So if I take a thin sheet of this material, what we learn in mechanics, if it's a thin sheet, okay, so I can try and do a plain stress approximation. So where I will build an effective 2D theory, right? I mean, all that I need to do is to know the deformation of the midplane. And uh, okay. all that I need to know is the deformation of the midplane. So what is plane stress? Plane stress basically says that the, all the three components of stress are zero. In finite deformation, I can write it in this way, but this is nothing but the equilibrium condition for minimizing the, lo the last column out. So I write the deformation gradient as three columns. 
And if I minimize the deformation out in the third column, as I've done here, I get plane stress. So that gives you a plane stress theory in finite deformation. Not quite, because if it's a thin film, I can also wrinkle. Remember, I'm doing finite deformation. So deformations like this, compressive stresses are bad. So you have wrinkling instabilities. So what, what you can do is to relax against wrinkling and that gives you a theory. And what is remarkable is that you can actually compute this explicitly. And that is what Pierluigi Cezana and Paul Plasinski did. And this is what you get. And that's quite interesting. So all that I need is deformation in the plane. So I have two principal stretches, lambda little m and lambda upper uh, big M, which tells you the two principal stretches. And what it's convenient to plot it as a, it's an isotropic material. So it depends only on these principal stretches. So this is the large of the principal stretches. This is the product of the principal stretches. Given that this is the larger principal stretch, this is an area where you can't, oops, sorry. This is an area where you cannot go. So it turns out there are different regions in this pneumatic elastomer. This is a region where you're pulling in both directions and you basically have a, a biaxial tension. But it turns out there's a region which emerges, which is here, where the state of stress is necessarily equibiaxial, right? The two true stresses are going to be equal independent of the relative difference between these two. So in other words, I can shear the material here, keep the area the same. This is the area, this is the larger stretch. So if I keep the area the same, I'm essentially shearing it. I'm shearing the material, but I have no shear stress. So this is basically will behave like a liquid in the plane. Okay. And then there's a region here where you have basically compressive instability. So you get uniaxial tension. This is like the classical tension field theory region. Okay. So, but in liquid crystal elastomers, you get this emergence of this very nice, interesting area. And it turned out that Kenji Urayama and his students were doing biaxial experiments there at around the same time. So they build a biaxial loading device. So this is your material. You stretch in one direction here. That's what you get. You stretch in both directions you get here. And then they did many different protocols here. And if I go back to my picture, if I look at a small region here where the deformation is homogeneous, I'm actually going by many of these different pathways. So you see this in here. This is what the theory, this kind of explicit theory, ideal theory will predict. And these are the experimental results. You can see there are X and Y true stresses and they're identical. X and Y true stresses identical, X and Y true stresses identical. So indeed this material behaves like a liquid in the plane. Okay, all of this was ideal. So you didn't have the plateau behavior here. So you can go back and try to do full field simulations. And um, this is some simulations that my student, uh, sorry, his name doesn't appear. Oh, here on the upper right, Hao Zhu did. And this was a new numerical method where we were able to solve these problems on GPUs. So it's actually quite, I'm happy to talk about it during the question answer session about the numerical method. And here's what you find. So this is your specimen. And you, the color map tells you something about the orientation. This tells you some average orientation in the plane. And so as you pull, you can see both true stresses are the same until it becomes more or less uniform. And then you kind of go. And here you can see that all the directors begin to align in these two directions. And exactly as you see in experiment. So we actually did simulations of many different experiments. So this is the comparison between uh, the experimental observations and the simulations. And what's remarkable is all of this depends only on five parameters, the three here and two associated with dissipation. So we fit it with two experiments and all the other experiments are direct comparison. So 
with a theory which is just five parameters, you can completely compute this entire complex behavior. You can also compare, um, you can probe the material with x-rays, which tells you the distribution. You can compare it. All of this works really beautifully. So once you know this kind of effective behavior by full field simulation, what it tells you is there's a region where the true stresses are going to be equal. You can take this insight and build a macroscopic constitutive relation. And in the interest of time, I will skip over this. But it's something which is completely macroscopic and you calibrate it, you can implement it on finite element. And this is the calibration with the previous experiments. But what it now allows you to do is to do complex deformations. And this is something that we are beginning to do systematically and you get really interesting, very complicated behavior. So this is an example where we can start from a molecular theory, completely molecular theory, like the warner tarantiev theory, study it full field in the mesoscale, and then build an explicit engineering model, right? So you can go all the way across these scales by getting insights and then doing some modeling along the way. Um, the other thing which I uh, is an, um, I told you that you can play off the material instability microstructure against. So one thing which struck me about these old experiments of Finkelman was the fact that you were pulling on this so much, but you never saw these films wrinkle. And you know, when I was learning about these materials, Ravi and I had a student, Ling Zheng, who was doing all these experiments on wrinkling. So she was pulling on them, seeing wrinkles. And so, so we built a theory which, this is what I, I told you that I can characterize the behavior on a, on a thin film by doing a plain stress. What I forgot to tell you was, you can also identify regions where you have microstructure and regions where you have wrinkling and they were distinct. So what I can do is now start penalizing wrinkling by adding a bending term. There's actually a more systematic derivation of this theory. So it's like basically you have a higher order correction for wrinkling, but not for microstructure. And if you do simulations with this, you find, so R is the parameter which tells you how much nematic it is. So this is ordinary rubber and this is a nematic. So if I now take this and start pulling, you see that the rubber will start wrinkling, whereas the nematic almost never wrinkles. And the reason for it is the state of stress in these regions here would become compressive, but here would not because of this ability to have shear deformation with no shear stress. Anyway, so let me skip over this and say a few words about the nematic genesis materials. So again, I have a liquid, I cool it down to a nematic and I cross link it here. So the director fields are built in. So that gives it really bad material. Why is that? Because if I go back to my energy, N0 is built in and fixed. So for example, if I did froze it in this particular way, as I heat it, this would like to contract this way, this would like to contract this way, and you have a huge incompatibility here. So these materials tend to be high energy, don't have any interesting behavior. But then you say, okay, suppose I make a thin film and put in a pattern which is incompatible, what will it do? It'll try to deform out of plane and by deforming out of plane, try to relieve itself of stress. So now this becomes an actuation mechanism. And because the actuation is throughout the thickness, it's going to be a very robust actuation. And indeed, this is what we tried to think about. So this was pattern that Carl modes Mark Warner and myself came up with. So this is a common defect in liquid crystals called, uh, called a disclination. So 
all the uh, directors are azimuthally arranged. So now let me try to heat it, what happens? It tries to contract in this direction and elongate that way. Can't do this in the plane, but it can definitely do it by going out of plane. And many years later, Tim White and Taylor Ware and others did this experiment. So this is the by an optical means they put in a disclination. And sure enough, they had nine disclination here and you see nine cones emerge this way. They put glass plates on it. These are very flimsy thin pieces of rubber and it can lift many, many, many times its weight. And the energy density was 10 to the three, not the promised 10 to the five, but we now understand that's because of instabilities in the cone. Uh, and if you kind of prevent that, you can get almost up to the 10 to the five that uh, you have. So you can ask yourself, how do I design with this? So, okay, so I can do this, but what patterns? And Paul Plasinski came up with this idea of isotrop non-isotropic origami. So doing really piecewise, constant director fields. So if I did this, I would get something like a uh, pyramid up here. But there's a degeneracy, uh, and then you can uh, put these two together. But there's a degeneracy because each pyramid can either go up or it could go down. And you can do all the isometric deformations of a pyramid. But then we came up with this idea of trying to do twisted pneumatics near the hinges. So if I have, and rather than, uh, if I put a twist across the thickness and the people who do liquid crystals know how to do this very well, you'll end up with bending, right? Because one is trying to deform one way, the other is trying to deform the other way. But the fact that um, the deformation is isochoric gives you this anticlastic deformation. So you have to prevent that and there's a lot of design but in the end, you can indeed design things which would prefer this state, but not this state. And then Tim White and Ben Kowalski did this experiment. And this is Ben on a hot plate trying to put the tent the other way. But the fact that it is designed in this state really forces you to do that. And then you can start putting these together and you can at least let your imagination run wild. If this is the director pattern you put in, once you deform it, it should close a hit it, you should close it up into a box, but we never got that far. So in the meanwhile, there are ways of printing these materials and that gives rise to a whole range of opportunities. So this is a field which is very dynamic. There's a lot of opportunities out here. So in the last few minutes, I'd like to spend some time switching gears again and talking about this embedding of azobenzene. So this is the old experiment that I described from uh, Ikeda and his colleagues. They made a motor out of it, but here's a more recent experiment. So what they, this was an experiment that Dick Brewer and uh, his collaborators, they took a strip and they shine light on it. And you see that you immediately start having this pulsating waves that gets. So the illumination is steady, but the deformation is cyclic. So that's a very interesting thing. But before I go to that behavior, I wanted to spend a minute trying to think about multifunctionality. So again, a small deviation. So I want to build a material which is responsive to certain stimulus, maybe light, maybe magnetic field, maybe electric field. And I'm thinking of using a soft material because of the reasons I told you earlier. So I can build molecules which are responsive to the stimuli, right? So let me call that a stimulus responsive block or SRB. So think of light actuation. I have a block a molecule which has certain shape and then it does this. So I can make this by magic of chemistry. These chemists can do amazing things. Uh, the dark arts as I call it. Uh, and then the question is, what can you do? 
So how can I make a material out of a single molecule? I can try and crystallize it. So I can arrange these blocks and they all act collaboratively. So I need more chemistry of making this. But there's an important piece of, uh, a very important piece of mechanics that you have to keep in mind. And this is a movie from uh, Panche Naimov and his uh, collaborators. So this is actually a crystal made out of a material which is photoactive. And this is what happens to it. He puts it in the microscope, shines light on it. And let me play the movie. You see what happens. It immediately shatters. Because as it tries to do this shape change, it builds up internal stresses and it actually shatters. And you see that there's a, the amount of internal energy built up was this. But there are other crystals which can deform. And let me go forward here. You'll see that there was a phase boundary. So let me play it again. Uh, you can see that there was a phase boundary which runs through. There you go. Sorry, again. You saw the phase boundary run through and this doesn't break. And the reason for it is basically Adamard compatibility condition. So suppose I have a crystal and I want to change the shape of this region so that it does this. What I really need is to satisfy the compatibility condition between the two and by an old result of Ball and James, that means that if I look at the shape change, that has to have a middle eigenvalue equal to one or middle principal value equal to one. And it turns out for this material, this is indeed true. This was thermally active, but more recently, Chris Bardeen and his collaborators have come up with another material, 9TBAE. Um, don't ask me to tell you what the chemical name is, but again, in this material, you indeed find that the middle eigenvalue is one, and therefore you have this compatible shape change. So what this tells you is basically, not only do you need the, the chemistry of doing the stimulus response, the chemistry of doing molecular uh, crystals, but you also need this chemistry of a particular shape change. And that turns out to be really rare and hard to do. So a second idea is you can try and embed this in a matrix. And now you have a problem because if your matrix is too soft, each of them is going to deform, you'll not get any collective behavior. If it's too hard, you'll not get any deformation. And you're going to lose a lot of energy in deforming the matrix. It's, a, it's going to be internal stress. So the better thing to do is to take a matrix which is phase transforming. And that is what azobin, uh, so that is exactly what was done with liquid crystals plus azobenzene. So we know there's this isotropic to nematic phase transition. What the azo does is basically shifts the phase transition temperature. And so if you're at a given temperature, hit it with light, you can undergo this phase transition, but now it is stimulus response. Uh, it is in response to light. And there are lots of things you can do with this. And this idea is not only with light, but you can use this idea with many, many other uh, stimuli. So there's actually a very powerful idea of building stimuli responsive materials if you know chemistry of uh, responsive molecules. There's a beautiful theory by Corbett and Warner, which describes this. And more recently, Rubing Bai and I explored this. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this but I want to spend my last minute or so talking about what happens when you illuminate a material. Very often when you illuminate a material, the light basically because light gets absorbed, it doesn't penetrate very far. So actuation is limited to only a certain region. <clears throat> and therefore what happens is if this sheet is thin enough, it starts bending. So you, in, this, in a particular limit, you can describe the spontaneous curvature change in this way. It's a first order action, which is proportional to the illumination. But because it's illumination, 
if I eliminate a certain region here and it bends, you see the deformation changes elsewhere. The consequence of it is the illumination conditions change. So there's this very interesting complex change between deformation and illumination and reaction. So there are three different phenomena and you have this collective behavior between those two. And that can give rise to the kind of behavior that I showed you in the experiment of Gallabart. So let's take a very simple beam. So this is basically all the Bernoulli beam equation, but with some spontaneous curvature, which changes with illumination. So, and then I just solve these three equations. I clamp it to the two ends, and then I get this behavior. And then I illuminate it, and this is what you observe. So you see that it starts beginning to flutter. And I call this photoelastic flutter. So let's try to understand this behavior a little more. So what happens is, let me see if I can stop it, uh, pause it somewhere, and then kind of really do a little bit at a time. So you see that it kind of basically goes, there's a little bump which starts moving forward, flips over, bump moves back or forward, up bump moves forward, down bumps moves forward, and so on and so forth. So you can look at the stability of this. Sorry. So what happens is I have an initially buckled state. I start illuminating. This bump starts moving forward. And then at some point it becomes unstable and then the down bump becomes forward. So you can do this full stability analysis and then with steady illumination, you get this kind of cyclic behavior. And that's very important when you're trying to th do things uh, in actuation. Very often you can actuate one way, but to get this kind of cyclic behavior is extremely important. And this combination of structural instability and the material behavior gives rise to this. And I call this photoelastic flutter exactly because of the analogous uh, aeroelastic flutter. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna stop and acknowledge all the people that I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. Uh, Mark Warner and John Biggins taught me, introduced me to the subject. Uh, Carl Modes was also a postdoc there. Paul Plasinski, who's now at USC, really uh, reintroduced me to the subject along with Pierluigi Cesana, who's a student of um, Antonio Di Sumone and currently in, uh, in Japan. Uh, Kenji Urayama in Kyoto Institute of Technology has been a great collaborator uh, and as have been Tim White and Ben Kowalski, sorry, it should say Tim White. Tori is a student who's studying macroscopic behavior. How Zhu is a student who developed this really powerful numerical method. Uh, Ruobing um, and Kevin have been working on the light actuation and Basile, Chris and Ryan have been great collaborators in this direction. So with that, I'm going to stop and I want to thank everyone for your attention. Uh, great. Thank you, Koshik. Uh, Shen Chang. All right. Oh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Koshik. Thank you for the uh, wonderful talk. You always uh, learn. Uh, I have, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you give a talk on liquid crystal elastomer uh, on the, in the workshop uh, more than half a year ago. But uh, yes. I, I see new things you add into the uh, talk, many new things you have already added into the slides. Uh, uh, always learn something uh, from a talk every time. Uh, probably uh, we should uh, uh, start the Q&A section. And uh, I'm open to open my uh, chat box as a mm. So I assume all the panelists will have a question. And uh, then I will just ask uh, each of you on the list in, uh, according to the order I see in my screen, on my screen. 
Okay, so uh, the name, the, the first name here on my screen is Paul. Do you have a question, Paul? I know you are very familiar with uh, all the content, but just in case if you have questions, uh, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, can you hear me, Kaushik? Yes, I can. I'm sorry, there's people are sanding the walls, so uh, it's <laughs> if you hear that. Um, but I guess the interesting aspects that I didn't uh, know about yet was the was the molecular crystals. And then the idea to embed them in essentially a liquid crystal elastomer matrix. Yeah. So, so I guess your your basic idea is that the liquid crystal elastomer matrix is a very flat energy landscape, right? So whereas the molecular crystals are very rigid, right? And so somehow that's going to enable compatibility more so than just middle eigenvalue equal to one. Is that is that the is that the sensor? Oh, so that's one way uh, you can think about it. Uh, I think it's a combination of the fact that. Uh, okay. Uh, so I think you should take. So let me uh, rephrase that. I think you have to take that cartoon that I showed you. Uh, with a great with a pinch of salt, right? I mean, it's only a cartoon. Remember that in the case of LCE. <clears throat> plus molecular uh, LCE plus azo. This is all at the molecular scale. So you don't have this, you don't have the, the kind of mechanical, it's not at a macro scale, it's not at the scale at which elasticity is. So the correct way of thinking about it is exactly as Corvette and Mark did, right? I mean, that uh, it's at a statistical level. And the fact that the ASO is changing from a sister trans uh, configuration tells you that you are, the fact that you are doing from sister trans tells you that, uh, think of these cis states as adding temperature and the trans state as, as adding alignment, right? So it promotes the phase transition. So more trans means it promotes the nomadic state less trans. So the idea here is that not so much the compatibility, but really the idea that it pushes you from one well to the other by using the phase transition. But the kind of ideas that you described in other fields where instead of molecules, if you use nanoparticles, that's going to be exactly what you said. At the, if you use microparticles or nanoparticles, what you said is exactly right. And there are other examples uh, that you can do, for example, magnetically aligning uh, like, uh, microparticles. And then what you said is very. Okay. Uh, let me see. Li uh, Qing Jiao. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor, for giving us this so nice talk. Um, I'm Li Qing I'm from France. So here I, I just, you know, in your uh, animation or your movie, I thought you, 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 you tried, you know, stretch the, the material, the sample. So I just wondering, you mentioned the, the several parameters could affect the result. But here, my question is about what about the um, person's ratio of porosity. You know, if you make the material as the uh, nematic, so sometimes if the particle is too big, the porosity probably could affect the result. Maybe it also could generate the rinky, you know, inside. So I just wondering, was this two parameter affect your, uh, could this par two parameter affect your result or not? Must sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um... So uh, uh, a quick clarification, I drew this as rod-like molecules, but again, remember these, this is at a molecular scale, it's two nanometers, right? Mm -hmm. So these are not big particles, these are really molecules. So, uh, however, when you make liquid crystals, uh, when you do go through the chemistry, and I see Taylor smiling there, uh, when you go through the chemistry, uh, you do have a lot of gassing. And so that can put in porosity, which is something which 
you try to avoid by curing in a vacuum furnace and doing all kinds of magic, but um, that can affect. And that is something which uh, uh, you try to avoid, but if, if there is some, then you have to account for it. Typically, all the results that I showed you are ones which don't have this. And in fact, uh, Kenji Rayama, uh, in the experiments that I showed you, tried to do a very careful uh, study of the thickness and found that these materials are almost, uh, are really isochoric. Uh, so they, uh, they, they are, are incompressible, so they undergo isochoric deformation. Mm -hmm. So porosity is to be avoided, uh, but if there is some, then you have to account for it. And I really don't know what the effect of that is. Okay, I see, I see. What about personal ratio, sorry? So it's incompressible. Poisson's ratio is one half. Mm -hmm. It's incompressible. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Chang, where oh, are you? OK. Oh, yeah. So it's like often accidentally uh, <laughs> the video was oh, screen was off. So uh, next one is uh, 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 David Waits. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, it was a great talk. Um, you had me a little worried about this flutter. I was thinking of the bridge. Uh, but uh, actually, what I was wondering about is I didn't get, maybe you said I missed, but is there some simple way of thinking what the frequency of the flutter is and the wavelength? Are they related in some simple way? Is it some resonance or okay. how can I think about that? Yeah. So, uh... Very good question. So, um, the, the word flutter was a little bit tongue in cheek, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, in this particular experiment, I'm working with a pre buckled beam. So, that sets the length scale, right? And I have done calculations for. <clears throat> One uh, or Kevin has done calculations for one bump and two bumps, but not more. So I, I, I don't know whether I fully know the full behavior. So for the one bump that I showed you, the way to think about it is the following, that at any given illumination, there are, if I give you, so because it's pre-buckled, at no spontaneous curvature, there are two buckle shapes, one up and one down. If I introduce spontaneous curvature, that's still true. Right? So it'll still be true that there'll be two shapes, one up and one down. But as you eliminate it, the bump moves to one direction because basically what happens as you eliminate it, it either promotes curvature or takes curvature away. So it pushes it in one direction. And then that state becomes unstable. So the only way it can go to the next stable, the, the other, state, other state is stable still. It goes there, but it happens to be on the left and then pushes it to the right again. So it's this, so what comes about is because of the fact that you have two stable configurations except at extreme points where you have only one stable configuration. So you push it towards that unstable point and then you push it back and that's what you go. Now the frequency depends, the only time scale comes from the time scale of light absorption. So the frequency basically is determined by that. And of course the structural parameters matter. Uh, we tried hard to get a good analytic formula for the frequency. And the truth is we don't <laughs> have that. Okay, thanks very much. It's very nice. No really. Uh, Yu Hang. Hey, thank you, Shen Qiang. Hi, Kashik. Yu Hang Hu from Georgia Tech. Yes. I was a Jigang's former student, yes. and uh, I'm sorry we missed you in ICS. My apologies. No, no, <laughs> no. ICS. But I think uh, EML provide you with a bigger uh, uh, stage so we can hear oh. more detailed. Uh, oh, I, I really do apologize about missing that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is exactly. one of the prices you pay for being an administrator, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. So um, uh, I, I, do, I don't work on LCE. Uh, so you mentioned uh, this uh, dissipation of uh, in LCE a little yeah. bit. And I remember Sun Hong is here. I remember yeah. that I uh, heard uh, a talk from Sun Hong. He showed that this LCE dissipation has a, um, a broad band of uh, uh, time dependency. So I was wondering, um, what is uh, the mechanism for this dissipation and why that is the case? Yeah, that's a very good question and something which Tori uh, Lee uh, is investigating very carefully. So she built a uh, loading device where you can independently control temperature, frequency, strain. I mean, it's this beautiful device and we are trying to do. So you can think that there are, so you can do something which is try to do the liquid crystal theory a la uh, Leslie and Erickson, right? You can start trying to do the liquid crystal uh, dynamics and start asking how many viscosities there are. And so this is the Leslie Erickson theory of liquid crystals and you extend it to, iso uh, uh, to elastomers. So you have the viscosity of the rubber chain, you have the viscosities of uh, the pneumatic elastomers. As best as I can tell, and this is speculation based on uh, fitting data, right? I mean, so I don't know anything more. As best as I can tell, the rubber viscosity, polymer viscosity dominates. Uh, polymer viscosity dominates. So why do I say this? We can do experiments at high frequency, right? small amplitude, try to understand what the rubber viscosity is. And then I can do macroscopic deformation where everything is switching. Right? And I can fit one of them and more or less explain the results there, right? I mean, so as best I can tell, much of the viscosity simply comes from the polymer chains. Um, I don't have any more understanding of this. And this, again, I, I should also mention, this is consistent also with the data from Vicky Nguyen's lab, right? Um, so that's the best I can tell you. Uh, but this is a very good open question. Uh, I had thought that the nematic dissipation would dominate, but it doesn't seem to. Maybe I'm just wrong. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, since uh, here is a related question uh, typed by Ratana Kuma, just read it, read it aloud, and uh, uh, then we can continue with the panelist. Uh, the question is, uh, how does the frequency of the photoelastic flutter depend on forward and back transformation times between trans and cis states? I believe uh, it's about uh, azobenzene right, uh, right. With, LC with LCE. So uh, it's complete. That's the, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the rate controlling mechanism. It's the it's the rate controlling mechanism uh, is exactly the uh, forward and backward to trans uh, isomerization uh, really controls the rate. Okay. Um, uh, next, uh, uh, Sang Ho. Uh, thank you much for your great talk. I mean, that's very inspiring and also helpful. So I, I guess as a follow up to Yuan's question, I, I was also very interested about this uh, uh, fluttering uh, by light. So then, as you mentioned, when you work with uh, LC, it's very dissipative. So I was very surprised that it shows this nice fluttering behavior. So I was wondering whether if you keep watching, whether if the amplitude keep decreasing, or as I also studied the viscoelastics of this material, it's highly also strain rate dependence, actually, as you increase the uh, frequency, actually, it's dissipation even goes orders of magnitude faster, uh, higher. So then if you play with this uh, floating frequency, I wonder whether you might see 
quite different, I guess, a fluttering behavior. So uh, first is that you're constantly supplying it with, it with energy with, from light, right? And the light is constantly sh providing its energy. So it's not, uh, so it's a force system. Okay. Right. Um, uh, so as best as I know, and uh, maybe somebody else here knows more, uh, in the Dick Brewer's experiments, okay, uh, in Dick Brewer's experiments, uh, you don't, it keeps going for as long as you're doing this, uh, unless somebody knows something else. As far as I know, it actually keeps going for long periods of time. Um, you know, I mean, uh, okay. In the model we did, we didn't put dissipation at the, we didn't put viscosity, we just had a elastic beam but I'm, but uh, I am completely confident, uh, not having done the calculation, of course, but I'm completely confident, but just by what I know of the calculation that exactly the same thing would happen even if I put dissipation. The amplitude will of course depend on the dissipation, but I don't see any reason why it would not behave exactly the same way. And the reason I say this is because it's exactly instability, structural instabilities, which is guiding, driving this. Right? I mean, so you push it to a structurally unstable state, it might take you longer to go there, but it's just pushing you to an unstable state, so it'll go there. I see. So um, the amount of useful deformation you'll get out of it will depend on dissipation, but I don't think the phenomenon will. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, Junsu, right? I think uh, you raised your hand also. Uh, hi, I am Junsu. Uh, I am a graduate graduate student in Jigang Shows Group. Um, thank you for your fantastic fantastic talk. I I could learn a lot thank about you. the liquid crystal elastomers. I have a, a one general question and one detailed question. Sure. Uh, let me start from the detailed question. So. Um, whenever I read about the liquid elastomers, liquid crystal elastomers, their shapes are usually strips, thin sheet. Um, I never seen the Berg system, such as a rod or cylinder or bun is a cubic like that. Is it related to the decay of light through the thickness plane or? It, um, why there's uh, this kind of tendency among a lot of papers? Is it related to the mechanical problem like that? So that is one question. Yeah. And the second question is general one. Um, I was thinking about the energy conversion efficiency. So to be used as a actuator in robots, basically we, we have to think about the efficiency. So how much light is emitted, uh, irradiated, and how much we can convert into the mechanical energy. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the first part, uh, know that people do experiments on sheets because uh, it's easier to stretch sheets and play around with sheets. But uh, I should have brought toys. Uh, if I were in my office, I would have toys. You can make balls out of it. You can make um, rods out of it because you see the, um, uh, and that's, uh, so you can make these, uh, uh, enough is known about the chemistry of these that you can make it, right? Um, so let me, the way you do this is you, so it's this, okay. So up till about maybe five years ago, I think it was, and uh, Taylor can correct me or Shen Cheng can correct me. It would be, have been hard to make, but the Yakaki Bauman Brewer chemistries really allow you to make big stuff. And um, you have to worry about degassing, but that's about it. So you just have to control the temperatures and uh, even a theory group like mine is able to make balls, so, <laughs> so uh, or rods. Uh, so you can make big things. And um, in fact, 
one of the reasons uh, I didn't get into it. One of the reasons I went to the effort with Tori to develop a macroscopic constitutive relation is this some really interesting, very complicated behavior when you put it to torsion and these complicated deformations. So, uh, okay. So your other question concern, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. So it's about energy conversion. Efficiency. Uh, energy conversion efficiency. At this point, very, 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 very poor. Uh, <laughs> for, with light, it's just terrible. It's, uh, and uh, so you can start asking yourself, um, Okay, uh, Ryan Hayward and his students actually did a calculation of the efficiency and I was trying to remember what the number is. It's very poor. Uh, and part of the reason it's poor, part of it has to do with chemistry and part of it has to do with mecha mechanics. So it typically turns out that there's an absorption spe uh, spectrum for the cis states and there's an uh, absorption spectrum for the trans state. And what you'd like is these absorption spectra to be different. The problem is they overlap. So you're constantly absorbing photons back and forth, all right? And you're going back and forth. So you're losing a lot of photons that way. Um, there's a lot of work on trying to do chemistry is to improve the chemistry so that the absorption spectra are separate and there are molecule, new molecules by Javier Reed and others which actually do that. Uh, so that's one uh, thing and the chemists have to figure that out. Uh, the other is the coupling efficiency, right? I mean, and uh, this has, this is something which uh, is also generally poor because um, uh, it is statistical, as you saw, and uh, and so uh, so that's not, and that's part of the reason why, if you want high efficiency, I believe you have to make molecular crystals. That every, there's really no coupling in efficiency; you're just basically coupling it. And that means that the dark arts have to do a lot more work. We can tell them what mechanics principles to use, but the chemists have to figure out ways of mo mo molecules. And I call them dark art because it actually is. I mean, what these guys can do is really amazing. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, uh, I, I should mention that uh, Ryan Hayward and his student, uh, they're in the process of putting together a review article on photomechanical actuation. And it's really, uh, it's an impressive piece of uh, work. They really dug through the literature as nobody's business. And so uh, it's, so, uh, if you're really interested in ask Ryan or ask me and I'll, I'll ask Ryan. Thank you. I will take a look at that review. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I typed the uh, list of name in the chat box. So you can see when you will be asked uh, to ask questions. So I think next one is Li Hua. Thanks, Chen Chiang. Hey, Kaushik. Thanks for Thank nice talk. Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, you talk about uh, genesis. Uh, does that happen in all LCEs or mainly in like a main chain LCE? Because for the side chain LCE, I'm thinking about, yeah, you have side chain, is this stupid in side chain LCE? Uh, then uh, related to that, um, because you talk about uh, three free energy turns and you mentioned the last one is called pneumatic, elast uh, pneumatic elasticity. And you said that effect is small if your sample is large enough. But uh, later you show uh, some very strong effects of experiments due to this uh, pneumatic genesis. So is that, called, is that due to the first energy turn or due to the third energy turn? So uh, let me take your uh, second question first. Uh, 
uh, at a phenomenological level, at a phenomenological level, at the level of phenomena, the final term, the nematic uh, elasticity has really no effect. Uh, it generates pretty pictures in our simulations. It contributes significantly to global warming because it requires a lot of computation, but uh, kind of uh, behavior wise, it really doesn't affect it. Uh, because your scale is so much large compared to the scale, scale of the, it puts a length scale and your uh, application scale, 10 nanometers, whereas, you know, even in your thinner sheets, it's 10 microns. So you don't see it at all, right? Um, <clears throat> Um, so now coming back to your first question, you're right. I mean, uh, typically you use your side chains for, for cross-linking. Um, so you would think that this would be only on the main chain elastomers, but you know, uh, never underestimate the chemists, <laughs> uh, what they come up with for, um, you have polymers with multiple chains, side chains. So I don't know that it's forbidden, um, but what you say is definitely true for the Akaki chemistries, right? So therefore, even for side chain LCE, uh, wherever you cross-link them, after you go to isotrope phase, they will go back to the same orientation. That's what I would expect. Uh, I would absolutely, uh, and Mark is nodding. So he probably knows of some material, which I don't. Uh, uh, so I would definitely expect that the uh, side chain would behave exactly the same way. It's a symmetry argument, right? I mean, ultimately it's a material symmetry argument. If you are cross-linking in the isotropic state, you have an isotropic material and you should be able to push it from one state to another. Okay, yeah, sorry, that's the one question. Uh, yeah. Second question. Uh, so you, uh, you also talk about it. essentially what we want to do is you want to minimize the energy but now you really have many uh, zero energy state. Uh, my question is uh, by, um, by solving, uh, in order to look for the equilibrium state, you can have two different methods. Uh, one is you can minimize, you do an optimization, you minimize the energy, you find your solution, or versus you can also find the corresponding um, partial differential equation and solve the equations. Yeah, I want to ask uh, in terms for this special material with so many like zero energy states, uh, do you have any comments on the advantage and disadvantage of these two methods? Uh, you know, this is uh, something which I thought I would mention when I was talking and uh, you're absolutely right. You can take two points of view. Um, you can try and solve for the equilibrium equations and you can try and solve uh, look for low energy states, right? Uh, I think both, uh, you know, I mean, uh, what I have learned by studying shape memory alloys for electrics, now liquid crystal elastomers, is sometimes um, there are place, there is place for both. And when you have so many low energy states and which you have fine scale microstructure, you can try and resolve the fine scale, but you are going to spend enormous amounts of energy trying to resolve the smallest regions, right? So think about an, a nematic stripe domain. If I want to try and compute it, I have to resolve the interfaces between two domains. That should be my mesh resolution, but I have to create a system which is very large compared to the length scale. So it's an enormously arduous task from a computational point of view. However, what matters is not so much the interface because there are lots of them. And in fact, you can show this uh, rigorously. What matters is the two states between them and the volume fraction between them if I were to, right? So if you want effective behavior, the part which determines the effective behavior is 
kind of the low energy states and how you are able to put the low energy states together. Of course, when you want fine details like the plateau, you have to work very hard. But to me that you have to work really extraordinarily hard to get very small details. Much of the earlier details is given by really looking at low energy states and how these are arranged, right? Um, so let me give you an analogy uh, in mechanics. You can try and study uh, and we are talking about instabilities, right? You can do two things. You can study instabilities by following, okay, the classical study is to study when does instability occur. Not interesting in these materials, right? Because you want to study very much into the deep into the unstable regimes. Mm -hmm. So you can try and follow the instability and the bifurcation diagram and do all the details. Or you can go deep into the post-buckled behavior make an ansatz about the post buckle behavior and study the behavior there, right? I mean, uh, tension field theory is a good example of that. If you're looking at very large membranes, you say it's going to wrinkle, so you can't have compressive stresses, so you'll only have tensile, tensile stresses. So that's actually really study, saying something profound about the deep, deep post buckle behavior. And that's an energetic argument roughly, right? I mean, it says, I don't care about how the wrinkles exactly formed, what patterns formed, but I know what the consequences are going to be and I'm going to write a theory based on that. And that's extremely useful. So I think there is great value in trying in these, trying to understand phase transitions, getting away from kind of trying to solve PDEs by entire details and first zeroth order behavior, the, main behavior is, is by this deep post buckle behavior where making clever onsets based on low energy states and then trying to put them together gives you insight. And then of course you'll have to do the hard work to, to figure out the details. And I think the kind of tools like young measures and these, these mathematical tools really help you in many ways to explore this deep post buckled behavior in rigorous ways. So I don't know that I answered your question, but I told you what my biases were. <laughs> thanks. Uh, Jiang. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jiang. Hey, hey, hey how, you? how are you? Um, good. Uh, this is Jiang Yu from South Tech at Shenzhen. I really enjoy your lectures as always. Uh, uh, as I understand, uh, that infinite number of uh, variant, if you could, well, in the lower symmetry state. So in such case, is the microstructure and the giving, you know, information is still unique or not? Uh, that's one. And also, do you see, you know, more complex microstructure other than the rank one laminate? Uh, especially at a smaller length scale. So you, you in your analysis, you ignore the, the, the length scale, but do you expect more like non-trivial topology, like, you know, vortex, anti-vortex, that kind of stuff, like which is, you know, explored in ferroelectric and so on? Yeah, yeah. so uh, let me, first of all, uh, there's no uniqueness. Uh, it's extraordinarily degenerate. No, but, but I mean, so uh, in ferroelectric, it's still generate, but under given state, you have a, you know, volume fraction is fixed. That's what I mean. You have a different combination of variant and with different volume fraction, for example. So, uh, yeah, so uh, let me go back to this picture I showed, this phase diagram, right? There was a region which I call liquid like behavior where there's complete degeneracy, there is nothing you can say about the microstructure. Um, you know. Then there was a region where I'd said it was microstructure where there was, the stress was uniaxial. There you can prove something really remarkable and this is Paul's work. Uh, what you can prove is that the young measure is unique. What that, it, what that means is that 
it will be a rank one laminate and the volume fraction will be fixed and the orientations will be given by the average orientation of the macroscopic strain. So there are regions where you can prove uniqueness, but in general, you cannot. Um, and, uh, and surely there are, you know, and, but as we see in the simulations, uh, full field simulations uh, uh, of the poly domain where of course, it's no longer fully degenerate, right? Because the non-ideal term, the degeneracy is gone. <clears throat> the material still finds very low energy states, uh, which globally, as you saw, the microstructure was uh, the, the orientation distribution was concentrating on two points, exactly as the theory would predict would happen to the young measure. But the pattern with which it did it is very complicated and depends on the particular realization of the simulation that you do. So statistically speaking, in certain regions, you can say something about the microstructure in other regions, you cannot. How about length scale? I mean, the length scale is determined at least in this theory by the, by the, uh, by the nematic elasticity, right? This it's the gradient of the nematic director. There's a coefficient in front of it that determines the length scale. So, so do you only see the strip domain? Uh, no, in, not in the poly domain materials, not in the non-ideal materials. Uh, oh, okay. In fact, you don't see stripe domains in the poly domains. It's very hard to tell the microstructure. However, as the X-ray uh, behavior showed uh, on an average, it becomes a striped domain because you only have two dots. It concentrates at two points. On an average, it's a striped domain, but the actual pattern is complicated. So for the striped domain, what is a typical domain width in the experiment? Uh, microns, because it's scattering light. Okay, I see. Okay. Right, because uh, it becomes opaque, so it's scattering light, so it's microns. Okay, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, next, uh, Professor Mark Warner. Right? So we know it's a pioneer, really pioneer in the, in the field. Yeah. Tashen, wonderful to see you, and a, a very, very nice talk. I mean, Great my major... Uh, comment is really, uh, it's remarkable how much uh, you actually get done. And I'm, I'm most envious, uh, you're a senior administrator and in 2020, there's been innumerable uh, profound pieces of work, which for me, I'm gonna take a while to absorb. So I don't really have questions on them. So I had one frivolous question, uh, Kaushik, and that is you showed uh, one of these molecular crystals blowing up. Yes. And it blew up into roughly speaking, two equal sized halves. And I wondered to myself, why are they roughly speaking equal? If there's a wave going through, it might turn one of the surfaces to powder as it goes. Um, but it seemed quite clean and in the middle. And I'm sure as a mechanics person, you know why. I, I don't. I did, a, uh, I did what uh, one would in mechanics call the Grady theory. Uh, so th th there's this question in mechanics of when things blow up, what is the fragment size, the fragmentation problem? And Dennis Grady was a pioneer in the field and he had a very simple energetic balance. Uh, he said, um, you try to balance the elastic energy with the fracture energy. Right, right, yeah. And that gives you a length scale. Yes. Yeah. And um, okay, you have to make a lot of assumptions in these blowing up crystals. They Particular movie I showed you is uh, bro broke up into two, but that's just was just the sample I showed you. But it breaks up into multiple pieces, and now uh, Pache and Amov students collected it. They actually know the length scale on it, and roughly you can convince yourself that this energetic balance works. Uh, uh, oh, thank you, Kashi. That's very nice. Uh, oh. 
turn off at this point. Okay. Um, give me a second. Let me take a seat. The uh, next one is uh, Aditi Chakra Bhati. Thank you, Shanchan. Um, hi, uh, this was a great talk. Uh, um, I'm Aditi Chakrabarty. I'm a postdoc uh, with Mahadevan at Harvard. Um, so I have a question uh, with regards to the, uh, can you talk a little bit about like, you know, the bounds on the uh, elasticity of the network as well as like, you know, how, like if you have a softer network, um, like, you know, how it affects the work per volume and um, like, you know, all the interesting behaviors that you showed here, like how can we think about uh, that? Yeah, so uh, you can do this calculation in linear elasticity very easily, right? You can ask, uh, so you can ask what is the impedance match and when I say this word impedance match, you immediately see, and it's static impedance. So it's basically you have to match the moduli. Um, of course, this is only in linear behavior, right? Uh, uh, it turns out that the match, the exact, okay. So order of magnitude of the match, the exact matches depend on whether you have a load control behavior whether you want load controlled actuation or strain controlled actuation, right? Free actuation or load um, a certain strain and you're looking for the, maximizing the work. So the constants differ a little depending on what you do. Uh, you can do hard, you can do this the hard way or you can use some kind of Hush and Strickman type bounds and just you get these numbers more or less right. Now, in the case of nonlinear behavior, finite behavior, um, uh, finite behavior, or in the presence of phase transition, I don't know of any close form way of doing it. Um, you have to, and uh, uh, we've tried to do some topology optimization kind of things to try and do it because the particle shapes matter, the moduli matter, the properties matter. So in the nonlinear finite deformation context, details matter uh, just the way it is. That's, that's what I can say in general. Uh, in, uh, but if you're dealing, if you think that you can get away with linear elasticity or at least get an idea from linear elasticity, just take the Hush and Schrickman bounds and that'll give you the right order of magnitude results. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next one is it John uh, Bickens. Hey, John. Oh, thank you. Yes, hi, hi. Thank you, guys. seen you in a while. No, it's been far too long. Um, yeah. I, but I wanted, this is a bit silly, really. I wanted to invite you to speculate uh, about a couple of materials that don't exist. So something you taught me a long time ago is that the difference between Martin site and LCE is it's a discrete symmetry versus a continuous symmetry. Would there be benefits therefore in the soft matter community to looking for something that breaks a discrete symmetry in the phase transition? And then going what your end of the talk, is there any benefit looking for an LCE with a lambda two equal to one? Yeah. Um... So uh, even in the context of Martin sites, we do know that uh, lower the symmetry, the better. The, or the larger the change of symmetry, the better, right? Uh, so for example, despite an enormous investment uh, in developing Martin Cytic steels, Steels undergo Martin Siddick transformation, and if you boost up the amount of nickel, it's actually perfectly good shape memory alloy in a single crystal. But the change of symmetry is cubic to tetragonal. Polycrystals of it completely fall apart. And in the context of mechanics, we know that uh, more slip system, the better it is for ductility, right? 
So in mechanics, often when you try to make lightweight, hard materials, you try to go with low symmetry hexagonal close back because you're trying to constrain the plasticity. So even in the context of modern sites, low symmetry is great. Uh, so um, no question about it in solid state, if you can break symmetry in a dramatic way, I could say the same thing about pearlectrics. Um, the morphotropic boundary is a great pearlectric exactly for that reason. So more symmetry you can break the better. <laughs> so that's kind of the philosophical point of view. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, polydomain LC's work is exactly because of this extraordinary degeneracy. I think polydomain LC's would have very difficult time if you didn't have this extraordinary degeneracy. So I think you asked something else, which I forgot. Oh, I also asked about whether uh, we should look for LC with lambda two equal to one. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, LCEs have this, it's a first order phase transition, but it's almost second order, right? I mean, <clears throat> and so lambda two equals one would, is very useful only if you have a, clear first order phase transition, where you're jumping from one shape to another. When you have this constant change of shape, uh, then you need to satisfy this condition over a long period of time. Uh, in principle, you can do this if you, uh, if I don't, you cannot do it in uniaxial materials, right? But you could do it in biaxial materials. Right. Uh, the question then becomes, is the rubber, is the kinetics determined by the kinetics of the phase transition or the kinetics of the rubber, the viscosity of the rubber? That I don't know. But certainly in, when you crystallize the molecules, lambda two equals one would be exactly the thing you have to do. But in the context of a rubber, I don't know. Oh, thank you. No. Always good to talk about materials that don't exist. OK, uh, uh, Taylor Well. Thanks, Taylor. and hey, Kaushik, I enjoyed the talk. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on how to think about uh, fatigue failure, particularly maybe in the simplest case in an unloaded liquid crystal elastomer. Um, and so I guess maybe there's two cases that come to mind, one where the, you have a monodomain uniaxial aligned and another where you have mostly um, a pattern that's free of internal stresses. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, I, this is a tr uh, question that I struggle to answer. Curious if you have any insight. Okay, so uh, given this particular audience, I'm the worst person to answer about fatigue failure, right? <laughs> uh, but I'll take it a shot. I mean, uh, uh, so you would expect failure at multiple scales in these materials, right? So, um, so uh, given that you're dealing with the rubbers, uh, you would have uh, some history dependence of the deformation. simply because there, there's metastability in the polymer chains. So you expect certain amount of history dependence uh, in rubber. Uh, what is, the, okay, this is those, there's this long debate in the mechanics community where the Mullins effect is because of degeneracy in rubber molecules or whether it has to do with localized damage. But um, you'll expect something in that scale. I would, exp 
okay, because of the phase trans, uh, because of the phase transitions, I would expect the fracture properties to be very good, macroscopic cracks to be very good, and that's been borne out, right? Um, so the uh, and then there is a question whether, so I would expect that the, these materials would show history dependence, which would eventually settle down. So there'll be some kind of shakedown behavior. Uh, but it might take a very large number of cycles to shake down. <laughs> and failure in terms of mic macroscopic ripping, uh, the evidence is in now that it's going to be a relatively tough rubber simply because you're going to unload a crack by, by, by formation of domains. Now, that's in a polydomain material or an isotropic genesis material, whether that, to what extent that remains true in a uh, nematic genesis is unclear because I think, okay, so I was a somewhat cavalier saying that nematic genesis, you froze the director. We really don't know whether that's completely true, right? I mean, at large stresses, would I be moving the director? I don't know that. And that'll depend on how you would unload and toughen the material. So you can see that I'm just talking and hedging, <laughs> but... Uh, you certainly would expect is my expectation would be that you'll see lots of history dependence that's borne out. You'll see that the fracture toughness would be high. That's again, borne out um, in isotropic genesis. I think the nematic genesis one, which is what you're interested in is not completely clear. Um, I think that's uh, maybe somebody else knows some experimental data that I don't know about. Okay, uh, uh, Kasia, can I add something on this? Yeah, please. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, as I said, I know the least about the subject in this. Uh, so, uh, uh, Taylor, we actually have measured fracture toughness of a liquid crystal elastomer, uh, well, two years ago, published paper uh, in International Journal of Applied Mechanics measured both a fracture toughness of polydomain LCE and a monodomain LCE. As uh, uh, Kaushik mentioned, polydomain LCE has a, is much tougher because of the transition. But that is all at room temperature. Mm -hmm. So uh, later on, when we give talk about LCE, people always ask about fatigue because uh, we always demonstrate this uh, actuation applications. So people always want to know uh, how many times you can run the actuator because LC is reversible. So we are doing a fatigue test right now. So almost have the uh, full data. Actually, we do it uh, relatively carefully because uh, now we have the uh, temperature oven. We measure the fatigue properties of the LCE at room temperature as well as high temperature. So uh, at room temperature, actually uh, both fatigue and the fracture uh, behavior of SE are very good. But uh, at a high temperature, uh, uh, not really. Cheng Cheng, are you doing these for isotropic genesis and nematic genesis? We, we, uh, for the fracture, we have done both. Okay. For fatigue, uh, we worked on a pneumatic first, a monodomain first. Okay. Yeah. And, uh... Is there a difference between the nematic genesis and isotropic genesis? Um, okay, let me take one step back. You are seeing pneumatic genesis and isotropic genesis. You are seeing uh, when I cross link it, whether it's yeah. in, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, then uh, it's, uh, um, actually we are doing all the, making all the LCE for isotropic genesis. We yeah. haven't done any, yeah. But I'm measuring their fracture and fatigue yeah. properties for both the polydomain and the monodomain. That is what I'm going yeah. to talk. Yeah, so uh, no, with the polydomain, there's a very interesting question. I think it's an interesting question uh, whether the nematic genesis would also have a higher toughness or whether that's mm. that is the part which I'm not sure about. Yeah, we, we, we haven't done that yet since our material synthesis is all isotropic genesis. 
It seems uh, Jigong also want to uh, have comments on fatigue and, and the fracture. Uh, Jigong, please go ahead. Yeah, this is a mainly comment and also question uh, sure. through experimentalists because the fatigue is not a theoretical problem, right? Caution. Uh, oh, you can speculate, Jigong. <laughs> No, 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 we actually uh, done uh, quite a bit. Uh, I, I, I was kidding. A uh, fatigue experiment in uh, recent time, not about a, it's a general hydrogel and general elastomer, not necessarily applied to uh, your, um, uh, your, your liquid crystal elastomer. But the, the question really is, uh, uh, when you talk about a fatigue, you're talking about a fatigue crack growth or uh, some other aspect of fatigue? Well, I think there's, I guess maybe there's, um, so I think fatigue crack growth is interesting, uh, but I also would be, uh, of course, interested in thinking about when you simply cycle temperature uh, mm -hmm. and understanding the reversible shape change. So from an engineering system, of course, fatigue fat crack growth is, is critical, right? And yeah. so, but I'd also sort of just, the reason I said maybe the, the hypothetical or the speculate bit is uh, if you didn't have that and you were simply cycling temperature, yeah. Uh, how would we think about, you know, uh, potential failure mechanisms? So in your case, a failure means a uh, fracture or failure means you lose actuation? <clears throat> oh. uh, I, I mean fracture. I, I don't know if that was oh, to me. But oh, I, it, it, oh, I see. Okay. So I thought um, you meant both. Well, I guess I've, I guess we've never, we've seen things break. We've never seen them stop actuating. And so, oh. um, and so from a, just a pure experimental standpoint. And so, so that's what drove the question. Maybe this is something uh, helpful to you. Um, we have been studying fatigue of uh, elastomer and a hydrogel for last a few years and have been able to make basic advances. So let me tell you uh, one remarkable result. So for many decades, for actually for more than a century, the fatigue threshold um, for natural rubber is a 50 joule per meter squared. Very brittle. Mm -hmm. Rubber itself is very tough, but the toughness all come from uh, this high dissipation mechanism. Doesn't really help fatigue. Mm. Now, um, however, recently what we did, uh, we have a number of schemes. So maybe we, we should get in touch. I think it's applicable for your system. So a number of schemes, but one simpler system uh, we implement is just making your polymer chain very, very long. Then you just uh, have a, the, uh, the kind of a tough uh, fatigue threshold we now achieve is a thousand joule per meter squared. The fatigue problem is essentially cured. It's about recent advances. If you have a genuine problem, we really should get in touch. Yeah, I, I think that sounds great. <laughs> Yeah, but Jigang, I, I, uh, um, so it, there is a possibility um, long, very long chain mm. or loosely cross link may not work well here is uh, if you uh, make, because the cross link density too low, it may lose some actuation capability of the LCE. There's a number of other things. So uh, we have a mm. similar issue. Uh, for example, um, there's a classical, you are re referring to this, if you make chain very, very long, the polymer will have very, elastomer will have very low stiffness, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the very simple cure is to make double network. So uh, yeah, we can talk about a detail. <laughs> Believe it or not, people have just published paper of double network liquid crystal elastomer yeah. a couple of months ago. Yeah. <laughs> they do things correctly, fatigue problem. Yeah. Work. Okay. <laughs> I think one of the issues in this material, as, as you said, um, you can always regain actuation by heating above the isotropic state. But when you cycle at the low temperature state, you have an evolution of the cyclic behavior. Right? The first cycle actuation may not be the same as the second cycle and so on and so forth. You can cure it by heating it to a completely different temperature. Uh, so that's like the Mullins effect in rubber, but it gets magnified in the context of liquid crystal actuation. And uh, that is another aspect which is actually difficult from application because you want uh, 
you don't right. want it checked out, right? Yeah, Pablo, I also have another experimental question, just quick. This is a quick, just for information only. Um, so do you guys, uh, experimental people, worry about um, his races in general for this material? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that's... Uh, okay, so there was something which was completely deceiving in my talk. I did talk about race. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't know, talk about cycles, right? And the behavior is completely different at different rates. And uh, there's incredible amounts of history. And uh, interchange due to interchange friction. Uh, I'm that is what we seem to come up with. That uh, all the data seems to suggest that much of the rate dependence comes from the polymer chain rather than the pneumatic. Uh, you know, okay. So if you think about liquid crystal liquids without the polymers, the dynamics are extremely fast. Uh, the dynamics are extremely, extremely fast. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's not surprising that much of the resistance comes from uh, comes from uh, uh, from um, the polymer chains. So I think a lot of the rate dependence comes from the polymer chains and the data seems to suggest that, uh, confirm that. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Kashi, there's a question uh, from uh, Anu, but uh, he has to leave because of, uh, so I read really, his question, he left the question in the chat box. I just simply read it oh. because uh, I think the, the talk will be, uh, is recorded on the YouTube. Maybe he can uh, come back to watch it replay. So the, the question is, uh, while explaining the isotropic genesis materials, you explained the phase field simulations. Can you e explain the numerical simulation methods a bit more? Um, let's see. So the numerical simulation method that we did was we took the, uh, I'll give you the short answer. Uh, I could spend, I could give a whole talk on the numerical method, but uh, so what we do is the following. Um, we take the warner Terentia theory with non-ideality and the nematic uh, elasticity. We add viscosity because of the polymer chains. So this is usual viscosity linear. And then we add a viscosity for the pneumatic reorientation. Um, okay. And then you try to solve the equilibrium equations associated with not uh, the evolution equations associated with it. And the way we do it is the following. So if I try to do it with finite elements, it would be, um, I could do it. It'll be a large, hard problem. Uh, but the way we do it is we rewrite these equations. We split the solution operator into two parts. One, which is the balance loss and one, which is compatibility and equilibrium. Compatibility and equilibrium are linear equations. Divergent stress equals zero curl of deformation gradient equal to zero. So these are just Helmholtz projections. You're solving basically a Poisson's equation. And constitutive relation, constitutive updates are completely local, they're point-wise, right? We get this nasty second order partial differential equation exactly because we are mushing the two. So if you separate them out, you get very good behavior and you can iterate. You can put it all together in a very nice numerical scheme. It's a local update followed by a Helmholtz projection, local update, Helmholtz projection. You iterate, you get a very good numerical method. Local update is trivially parallel. Helmholtz projection, there are very good algorithms to do in parallel. So you can put all of this in a GPU and uh, so this is all written up. I can uh, uh, 
there's going to, uh, we'll put it up on the archive in the next few days. So uh, uh, I, I don't want to give another talk now. I had a few slides on it, but then uh, I think <laughs> in the interest of time, I'll just kind of skip over that. But the whole idea is really trying to reimagine how you do compute, uh, continuum mechanics rather than mushing it all together into a differential equation, which you use solving by Galerkin projection, which is what finite elements are. You try to separate it out into the elements and then you iterate. And it turns out to be very effective as a way of doing it. So another way of thinking about it is the following, right? When you think about finite elements, you're solving divergent stress equals zero as an approximation. You're setting curl equal to curl f equal to zero as a rigid constraint. You're, you're imposing that exactly, whereas divergence s equals zero, you're imposing in an approximate way. There's nothing in the physics which says divergence s is less important than curl f equals zero. Treat both as soft conditions, as constraints that you have to solve in an approximate way. And that gives you a much better way of doing, uh, from a parallel implementation point of view, a much better way of uh, writing these equations. And it's very general because you can put any constitutive relation you want, it's local. Right? Uh, very good. So uh, there's a, another related question. So I just uh, ask Alice to about simulation also. So Alice, are you still there or do you want to ask something quickly about simulation? Uh, yes. Uh, really good. Uh, thank you. Um, so it's a really interesting talk. I'm Elise uh, from U Chicago. Um, I work a little bit on liquid crystals. So I'm kind of wondering um, in some fields like we have like representing the liquid crystal as more like a Q tensor. And, um, and in your simulations, you use more like a pneumatic elasticity expression for it. Right. And alternatively, you make use like some coupling between the strain field and the Q tensor. Do you expect any difference between these two um, approaches, like in theory and also in simulation? Yeah. Uh, I think it's this. Okay, so I really should defer to Mark, but uh, <laughs> but I think it's a matter of scales, right? Um, it's a matter of scales uh, and temperatures. Typically, we are interested in the behavior deep into the pneumatic regime. So the Q tensor does not change that much, except maybe at the interfaces, right? Um, so when you're deep away from the phase transition uh, and you're interested in very large scale behavior the topology of indi indi individual defects don't play that much of a role. So it, whereas, for example, I was showing you this uh, disclination, if I want to resolve what's going on at the tip there, the Q tensor probably plays a role, right? Uh, if I'm interested in the overall actuation, it probably plays a very little role, but if I'm interested in the details of the, at the tip, the Q tensor is very important. So I would say that the two theories address behavior at two very different length and temperature, uh, length scales and temperature regimes. The Q tensor is important when you're doing, trying to resolve fine details at temperatures close to the transformation temperature. Whereas when you're looking at large length scales away from the transformation temperature, um, the Q tensor is theory is overkill. Uh, so you treat, you treat the, uh, you minimize with respect to the Q tensor, you fix the Q and then you solve the pneumatic elasticity. I was kind of having a related question. So like when you have like the uh, stretching the uh, perpendicular aligned film, you have the forming of the uh, strap instabilities. And like, how do we understand it in terms of, for example, the um, it has like a defect formation and defect annihilation, or like it's not the way that people think about these materials. So you could definitely think about it from the point of view of defect formation and defect uh, annihilation. Uh, 
but uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of interesting physics that happens at that scale at the scale of the interface. But what I'm really interested here is at the scale. So I'm interested in a scale of centimeters, whereas the physics that you were describing happens at the scale of tens of nanometers. So, okay, it's somewhat of a, okay, I'm gonna make a statement which sounds initially contradictory, but it's actually quite subtle. So the, the fact that there are so many interfaces in these materials tells you that the interfaces don't matter. <laughs> interfaces don't really control the physics. Uh, and the reason for this is the following. If you, if you start writing a theory which has some physics of the interfaces through the Q-tensors, through the uh, pneumatic, uh, through the entire Q-tensor theory, and then you try to do a large body limit, right? the interfacial terms are going to be a higher order correction and the pneumatic elasticity is going to be the leading order term. It's degenerate, but it's going to be the leading order term. And the reason for it is that the number of interfaces doesn't scale as the size of the domain, but scales as some power, which is less than identity of the number uh, of the size of the domain. So. Uh, L to the one third is our best understanding, but uh, it depends on details. So the number of interfaces doesn't scale as the number of the size of the domain. So in some ways, the effect of the interfaces goes away. The fact that you have so many interfaces, but the relative importance of the interfaces becomes smaller as you go to a larger, larger uh, numbers, because relatively speaking, there are fewer interfaces. Does that make sense? Uh, so, since I'm only interested in macroscopic mechanical behavior, I can understand it by ignoring those terms. But if I were interested in behavior at the scale of tens of nanometers, those terms would be very important. So, just to rephrase it a little bit, do you mean that so the energy contributions from like generating those interfaces is really small compared to all the elasticity and other things? That's exactly right, yes. That's exactly right. And the reason is when you do the calculation, you see that the number of interfaces scales as a lower power of the size of the domain. Um, so their relative contribution to the energy becomes lower. Okay. Thank you very much for the talk yeah. and answering your questions. It's really brilliant, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Jigong, do we have a cut of time for the discussion? So I see more than, uh, I still have a, 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 do we have a cut of time? Go ahead. Uh, as long as a Kaushik and you stay here, <laughs> you can ask questions. Okay. <laughs> we have no rule. <laughs> okay. Kaushik, what uh, is your- Anyone comment? who knows me, it knows that I like to talk. So I'm happy okay. to be here, but I feel very guilty taking all your times uh, at the all these- are, uh, so, People feel uh, free to leave. So please feel free to leave. Don't try to be polite, please. <laughs> yeah. This is a become informal gathering now. Just, uh, you know, after lecture, we all relax and we all love to talk to Kaushik. And of course- yeah, It's a little early for really relaxing, so. <laughs> for me at least. <laughs> uh, great. So I actually uh, have a hard cutoff uh, at, in about half an hour, so. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Raja, uh, Raja Jom, right? I think Raja Jom Mahat. Are you still there? No, uh, he's not. He's not? Okay. So then uh, we move to uh, Robin. Hey, Kaushik. Um, this is Robin from your group. And uh, very nice talk. Um, so You're I don't required have- to say that. <laughs> I don't. I don't have technical questions. For, I, I, at least for another two months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I thank Sheng Qiang for putting me in the queue. I didn't even raise my hand, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I. So I don't have technical questions, but I do have a question uh, in general. Before that, let me add something. Uh, uh, so uh, brings back to uh, Song Hong's 
idea about dissipation and uh, also Jigan's uh, questions about dissipation in this LCE. My experience was dissipation is just huge in these materials. So it's a matter of fact how you see that. It's an opportunity, but sometimes it's a curse. But I'd like to add that in this materials, material scientist people, uh, for example, Taylor here, they, they'd like to also talk about liquid crystal polymers, which is basically a glassy polymer uh, compared to liquid crystal elastomers, which is loosely cross-linked. So many of these actuations, if you see high speed and maybe potentially low dissipation comes from this liquid crystal polymers, mm -hmm. this glassy polymers where you actuate a single layer, you have beam bending and oscillation. So I think that's one point I want to add. And then my my general question is for uh, for you is how do you see this uh, uh, the future of actuation? So the experience I had since the last ten years I don't know if I'm too young or not is there's a boom of actuation in these active materials, and uh, both you and Jigan have worked on so many other materials from piezoelectric, ship memory alloy, now hydrogels, liquid crystal elastomers, ship memory polymers. What's the engineering side of this? And many of these now, we see that as maybe toys or lab experiments, but what, what are the future of this uh, in the engineering or large scale application of this actuation? Maybe both you and Jigan can comment. Jigan, you want to go first? You go first. All right. Uh, so that was part of why I had my first two slides. Um, that was why I had my first two slides. Uh, I think, and this is for someone who studied in Harvard, this won't come as a surprise uh, in many ways. I think that, I really think robotics is in the ENIAC stage of, the analog of the ENIAC in computing. We put a frame, we put an actuator, we put a sensor, we put a microchip, all assembled by hand, all done, you know, for incredible amount of effort and you have, 28 degrees of freedom and we say, wow, what a great machine, right? I mean, so, uh, so I think where, and this is for you guys, uh, where I think all of this, we are laying, I, I believe all of this is really a background for an engineering that we don't fully know yet. We can't fully conceive yet but where we will be able to make very complex multifunctional devices with integrating multiple elements into the same material base, very much like we do in CMOS. So there's a base material system and you put different things. It's all integrated into one. And I think that is where mechanics mechanical device engineering will head. And I think what we are doing is basically trying to scratch on the surface of that, not knowing where it is. Um, so that's my real uh, belief, a sincere belief actually. And that's part of the reason why I think about actuation in so many different ways. Uh, whether this will play out, I don't know. But in the short term, one thing I learned from the shape memory business is nobody has any idea what the application is going to be. If somebody who's working on a basic material tells you they know the application, uh, you can bet your money that the application that they're working on will never pan out, right? Um, and you think about shape memory alloys, right? I mean, actuation was the big thing. Where does it work? Uh, what gave it the boost? Some of you won't know this. Uh, you probably don't know this. What really gave the industry a boost was cell phone antennas. Remember, all of us had this cell phone antenna with the antenna. So the industry production base ex exploded, um, became a huge industry. 
but the real insight was by this guy, uh, um, uh, Tom Durek, who said, forget actuation, let's make uh, medical devices. Why? In the mammalian temperature control is the problem in a mammalian environment, temperature is controlled. Multiple actuation is a problem in an implantable medical device, you need only one, right? So that's what, where really the applications came. I don't think anyone, you go back before Tom and you, okay, some interventional cardiologists thought about this, but it was very much actuation driven. And even now actuation of shape memory alloys is very small. Uh, so with liquid crystal elastomers, the first applications are probably gonna be damping. It's <laughs> probably going to be damping. Uh, simple applications, right? C controllable damping, right? I, I don't know, but it's very hard in these early stages to understand what the actual application is going to be. be you know, who would have thought that computers would become communication devices? Right. Uh, so, um, so it's very hard to envision what an actuation would be. But I really do believe that the broader context of what all these different actuation platforms is really changing how we make mechanically actuated, complex mechanical act robotics uh, in some ways. Anyway, that was my long answer, uh, Jigang. No, well, actuation materials, I guess uh, many of us, uh, have a look at uh, uh, PZT as a classical example. It took many decades yeah. of development and before finding application. Now we all know the application is limited because the deformation is very small. So many of us here also look at another technology not mentioned too much today. Uh, it's a dielectric elastomer. Yeah. Right, that has about 20 years of a history. I was involved uh, when the, not involved initially. The paper published in that week, it was published in Science. I read that paper. I said, this is something for me to do. Of course, I didn't do anything after many, uh, after a decade or so, uh, pick it up. Uh, but, uh, but you got involved and you talk to people in the field um, initially, it was uh, this a huge, enormous excitement. Lots of a uh, cool demonstration, zero application. And then, of course, when, when funding dried out, and, uh, and then people just left. And then the problem is still there. We still don't have large deformation actuation. So then people come back, young people come back. So we're seeing this uh, second wave. So. I uh, well, shouldn't have a despair because uh, you never know things you don't know, right? You develop these things. Uh, the other thing give us a lot of perspective. I'm sure everybody saw this pneumatic uh, actuation. Very simple idea, gas, rubber, right? So when uh, uh, George Weiss has invited me to work with him in, uh, I think it's a, uh, 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 2007, uh, two, yeah. very early on, before his uh, first paper. I said, oh, how, 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 how can I do any mechanics, serious mechanics? You're just a different tube, different shape, uh, right? Uh, cannot really do serious mechanics. But then you see a lot of things are actually done because the pneumatic actuation has been useful for a long time. What uh, George saw, but uh, I couldn't listen to him, is uh, the recent ability to manufacture small things and a complicated shape that open up huge space, design space, therefore application. Now this has become mainstay. Who knows, maybe in 20 years, we're still talking about pneumatic actuation. Even though the mechanics is still to me, not very interesting after so many years, but it's a serious. Sure. So that's, uh, these are the two things I have some personal involvement, lessons learned. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Um, 
Sulu. Thank you, Xinxia. Uh, thank you, Akashic. Great talk. Oh. Enjoyed it. So, as I said, I was reading your, your unpublished note, <laughs> theory of uh, Martin Cetic uh, microstructure and the shape memory uh, uh, effect. So, when I read it in the middle of the, the notes, I have one problem or question that probably related to your today's talk. Yeah. So, maybe this question is very naive, okay? So uh, in phase transitions, we have stretch, the phases have stretch, and the phases can also undergo rotation. And rotation is necessary to enforce the uh, compatibility conditions between the phases. And that's how your fine structure emerge, emerge right? Like I have twins, you have stripes, right? Very fine twins, right? So in your early work in this book, in this note, you construct very nicely this so-called weakly convergent sequence to minimize your energy functional. So this way, you are forced to find the fine structure to minimize the energy. But this is, a, this is not a classic way we do mechanics, right? So we do mechanics, we write out the energy functional, we minimize the energy to find the microstructure the other way around. But I see that if this, if this, if the, if the energy functional that you wrote down is only weakly convergent, you might have problems in convergent, in, in convergent, in convergence. If you grab a like, if you use a, some software or package, um, you have a minimizer, minimize that that, that energy functional. You want to be able to minimize it. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Okay. So um, right. So first of all, the idea of weakly convergent sequences and its relevance to mechanics is not mine. It was the seminal work of Ball and James, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the, that was really their seminal contribution. And you can think of, once you realize that, you can think of a lot of things we do in mechanics. Uh, the derivation of, uh, derivation of um, for membranes, for example, the the, the, the tension field theory you can uh, drive using those ideas. So uh, it's a tool to explore deep into the post bifurcated regime in, in many ways. Uh, so it is, it, is a, uh, it is an idea that goes back to Ball and James and I learned it uh, from uh, James and the others who contributed to it too. So, uh, so first of all, it's not my idea, but uh, uh, something I learned. Um, but that is what you said is the essential problem with these materials. That when you have fine scales, that means you have a very degenerate energy landscape. And the low energy states are going to be extraordinarily complex. So if I so if I in the talk today, if I were to just talk about the entropic elasticity and try to minimize that. If I used a software for doing this, I put a mesh, I minimize the energy, I get a microstructure. I refine my mesh, I minimize the energy, I'll get a completely different microstructure. I refine the mesh, but I will never have convergence. So what gives convergence in physics turns out to be when you are writing a theory, you are writing it at a certain scale. When you have phenomena at a smaller scale, you have to correct for the smaller scale phenomena. And that is what the Frank elasticity does because it puts a gradient. So it introduces a length scale. So it is at that length scale. So in other words, <laughs> if you're looking at a very large length scale, it's fine to ignore that term and try to study the consequences. But if you really want to resolve the fine details, you have to add that length scale and you have to resolve things at that length scale. So, so to do a numerical simulation, you have to regularize it. But that makes it very expensive. So that is why these simulations tend to be very expensive. There's an alternative method, which is why weakly converging sequences are useful. Because you can study what the consequences of the weakly converging sequence are and write an effective energy which takes implicitly into account the effect of microstructure. That is what we'll call an effective theory or relaxed theory. 
And you can use that for computation. And that becomes then, it's also hard because, because these now have soft and hard regions, right? So you're, they are very stiff problems uh, numerically, but you can solve them. Uh, but you're absolutely right. If you, these ideas are very powerful, but you cannot directly include, use them in computation. You have to think about how you're going to do that. I, I definitely follow up your, your relaxed theory stuff. I will talk to you. You know, in, in mechanics, we use it all the time. You think about crystal plasticity in a certain way. Yeah. Crystal plasticity in, in a way is a relaxed theory. You're saying the dislocations can do whatever you want. The only thing that matters is how much activity is there in the slip system. I don't worry about the fine scale microstructure of the dislocations. So it's a relaxed theory, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that it can be rate independent and when it's rate independent, it's degenerate, right? Yeah. So we use that in, we actually use these ideas in mechanics oh, uh, even in classical problems. Great, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, thank you, Sulin. Uh, Raja uh, seems uh, there was some problem with his uh, cell phone. He just uh, uh, texted me. Now you can you can ask. Hi, uh, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So nice talk. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so the question uh, that I had is that uh, related to this fatigue and the degradation of actuation that happens due to the fatigue. So uh, what in the metals like shape memory alloys, we can talk about uh, dislocations and the change of substructure and how it is related to fatigue. So how, what kind of microstructural changes if that kind of thing happens in liquid crystal elastomers. So what kind of microstructural changes does it relate to fatigue in liquid crystal elastomers? And uh, then somebody talked about uh, it is difficult to model fatigue. So is the problem uh, related to this uh, capturing the microstructure that evolves with fatigue in the actual analytical models? So thank you. Um, thanks. Um, uh, as we discussed sometime earlier, um, we don't completely understand all the mechanisms of fatigue. Uh, so I want to clarify it. As a mechanic, uh, as a mechanics person, we typically have a very particular phenomenon when we talk about fatigue. But in the context of materials, people use fatigue in more than one context, not only in the technical context of fatigue of structural materials, fatigue related to fracture and fracture light process, but also fatigue in the sense of microstructural changes and history dependence. So uh, we, have to, we have to be careful about what we are talking about. But as we discussed earlier, and I don't think we should need to kind of go over that again, uh, there are things we know and there are many things we don't know about it. Um, these materials in the context of liquid crystal elastomer have non-classical in the sense it's not failure related history dependence and you can call that fatigue because actuation goes down with time. You can cure that by heating it above the isotropic temperature and reviving the material. But there's also fatigue related to micro failures, micro breaking of bonds. And uh, that remains, we are beginning to understand it. And as Sheng Chang said, he had done some work on it. As Ji Gang said, that's a solvable problem in the material sense. Uh, so we are learning about it, but remains a subject of interest. I have to leave in about five minutes. Um, sure. Uh, uh, probably uh, we have two more questions from uh, uh, Xue Ju. Probably uh, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks, Xin uh, Chen, uh, and also hi, uh, Kaushik. Thanks for your very nice talk. This is Xue Ju Wang from the University of uh, Connecticut. So my question is about the spatial pattern, uh, patterning of liquid uh, crystal 
uh, uh, molecules. So uh, because it's uh, uh, closely related to the microscopic shape changes of the material. So I saw that the people have been using, for example, mechanical alignment, including the work from uh, Seng Qiang and also uh, surface patterning and more recently 3D printing and the two photon lithography. So what's your uh, perspective on this uh, spatial patterning? What are the challenges and uh, opportunities here? Oh, I think um, it's, it's huge opportunities, right? I mean, if I can pattern into a complex shape, and if I can make a material in a complex shape with a particular director alignment, I can really use mechanics, uh, structural instabilities in a complete way, right? So the challenge of actuation is twofold. Um, I like to use energy as the measure of actuation, because you can think about force, you can think about displacement, but they're fungible in some ways. What is really important is the product of those. So what you want in an actuation setting is you want an actuation mechanism which uses the full material. It's not one part of the material is actuating and the other part is not actuating because you know bending is great if you want to show how, to make a floppy material and it'll bend a lot, but it, it's good for nothing, right? It's floppy. So. So what you really want to think about actuation in the context of full deformations. And there, I think the ability to make complex shapes play off against structural instabilities is going to be a very powerful tool. I mean, uh, Jigang talked about pneumatic actuators, but what, one of the things that they do there very cleverly is use structural instabilities, balloon instabilities, and so on and so forth, right? I mean, so they're using these structural instabilities in very clever ways. So I think that's really the reason why these 3D printing to photon lithography are going to be very important um, because you're going to be able to make aligned materials in complex shapes. Uh, and the, that opens up opportunities which are very, very high. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Kosh, you got one last question, probably? Sure. From uh, Hussein. Can you unmute? Yes. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bhattacharya. Uh, my question is uh, about, uh, you mentioned that there is zero shear stress, even though there is shear uh, deformation. And um, my question is, what is the origin of it? Maybe I missed that part. Does it rate dependent? And does it depends on the director index okay. or director vector? So it is because the microstructure a lot, um, rearranges itself to accommodate the shear. So suppose I have a stripe pattern. Let me give you a simple example. Suppose I have a stripe pattern and I can change the volume fraction of the stripe pattern. I'm basically making it, I'm keeping the area the same, but changing the relative dimensions, right? I'm going from a rectangle this way to a rectangle that way constantly through rectangular shapes. So I'm shearing the material because I'm changing the prin principal stretches, but I'm keeping the product the same, the area the same, right? So it is because I'm dynamically changing the microstructure. The question then is, is there a rate dependence to it? What we have seen experimentally is that the rate, the, the actual stresses uh, and theory Fitted theory, fitted at one time scale and then used elsewhere, also suggests <clears throat> is that while these materials are rate dependent, the difference in the true stresses in that regime is not as rate independence. In other words, the true the level of true stress will be depend on the rate, but their difference will be still zero. So this is another reason which tells you that the pneumatic orientation happens much faster 
than the than the than the uh, uh, polymer viscosity. So that's what uh, we seem to observe, and it's kind of borne out about what we know about these materials. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay, I think we uh, probably can uh, conclude today's uh, webinar. So, Kaushik, you have a few things more things to say, or Jigan, you want to uh, comment about the whole webinar? Yeah, Kaushik, you have uh, any closing remark? <laughs> I will defer to the wise man. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, Shinchang. Thank you very much, Shinchang. You're terrific. Yeah. All right, Kaushik, a brilliant talk as always. So we uh, yeah, for so long. Thank you. So you have to go back to your <laughs> high end activity. <laughs> thank you very much, Ji uh, Gang. Thank you, Xing Cheng. And thank you, everyone, for sticking around for so long. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you, Kaushik. We'll see you around. Bye. 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 Bye.